Hey, my name is Chris Brennan, and you're listening to the Astrology Podcast. In this episode, I'm going to be talking with astrologer Laura Nalbandian about the planet Neptune and what it means in astrology. Uh, so, hey, Laura, welcome to the show. Thanks, Chris, for having me and making time for me. Yeah, so you're actually out here on a site visit. You're you're planning a big astrology conference that's happening in Denver next year in August of 2022. Definitely. So this is actually a hotel I had a conference. Gosh, uh, seems a hundred years ago, but it was 2003. Mm. Did a conference in. So it's not an unfamiliar hotel to me, but it's been a long time. So. ESAR is having their conference, finally. Mm -hmm. uh, normally, they have a conference every four years, so their last conference was 2016, and I believe, if I remember, it was in Arizona. Um, right. And then their intention was to have, in four years, was 2020, and we know how that went. Yeah. 2020, everything came down. Right? I remember there was something that happened last year. Yeah. You know, a little I know. Fuzz, was, fuzzy on the details. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. It was, a little, it was a little bump in the road. Right. Uh, Unfortunately for all of us, it's you know been an ordeal in all of our lives in some way or another, mm -hmm. and certainly in the process of you know coordinating events. All us event coordinators have certainly had to deal with you know moving events in one way or another. So mm -hmm. I believe 2020 it was scheduled for September, then it got canceled. Right. It was scheduled for this time in 2021 mm -hmm. <clears throat> again. Too much uncertainty. Glad they did it with the Delta variant on the rise. Right. And so it's scheduled for August 25th through 29th <clears throat> at the Weston in Westminster, which is a suburb mm. between Denver and Boulder. Okay. So that's where it will be held. Uh, and we have every focused intention of making that happen mm -hmm. after two years of canceling. Right. So. Right. So they had previous coordinators and everybody got burnt out. You know, when you're yeah. playing in a conference and it gets canceled and then you move it and then it gets canceled again. Yeah. <clears throat> people were getting burnt out. Yeah. Well, uh, luckily the astrology is going to be much better next year than it was last year. Um, so that should help. And um, yeah, I'm looking forward to that as one of the first in person conferences that will take place uh, since the pandemic. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so we'll talk more about that later and get into some of the details, but there will be a website, which is at uh, ESAR's website. I guess people can Google. They can actually go to esarastrology.org, but the mm -hmm. direct website for the conference will mm -hmm. be esar, I-S-A-R, okay. 2022.org. Okay. It is in development at this point. Mm -hmm. So here we are in August. So it's in development. We plan to have that up and running more clearly and have all those things in place mm -hmm. uh, in within the next month. And registration, we plan to open that. Originally, we thought we might get it done in September. Mm -hmm. But through a planning process this week while we were here with the board, we realized that October, after Mercury goes direct, would be a better time for us to open registration. So Yeah, that's a good call. That's one of the positive things of working with astrologers on practical events is being aware of things like that. Absolutely. You know, and it, we were going to open under Mercury Direct, but then as I started to look, Mercury was going to be in its shadow, mm. go retrograde, be retrograde for most of the early bird section. Okay. So I think in many ways kind of dumb and then, right. you know, my bad and thankfully we rectified that, but it would have been unfair forcing people to register kind of under uh, Mercury retrograde to get the discount, and we don't want to do that. So Yeah, that could be chaotic. Yeah. Um, cool. All right. Well, I'm excited about that, and um, I'll put a link to it to the website in the description below this video or on the podcast website where people can find more information. Um, so just kind of pivot to our, our topic today. So I've been doing this series on each of the planets where we do one planet per episode and do sort of a deep dive into the significations and the meaning of that planet. And I thought you would be a good person for um, Neptune. I'm not sure why I thought that initially, but I, I had some. I know you, you've lectured on that. Yes. Um, but sometimes people have it, uh, like like <laughs> Sam. I did the Jupiter episode with Sam because I knew he has a prominent Jupiter and has some very Jupiterian like themes and vibes in his life. And I couldn't th remember why I felt like that way with you <laughs> as well, or what how it was placed in well, your chart. Do you? Do you share chart details or? Oh. I don't mind. Okay. Um, 117, 1959. Okay. Do you want to show it? You can. Okay. Um, 6.23 PM. Okay. Once you get there. 
let me pull it up. But you actually have Neptune like exactly conjunct your IC, right? Yes, I do. Okay. It's the closest conjunction to anything in my chart. Brilliant. Yeah, it's within, I believe it's within a degree or minutes. And uh, yeah, so you have it. And uh, of course, that's also in your fourth house, and that's that's mom. Yeah, so okay. I have in, yeah, you can see it conjunct the IC. What is that? Five and six degrees. Yeah, so they're within a degree. Uh, I don't have um, any real close conjunctions planetarily. They're all uh, separating conjunctions kind or of, too wide. wide applying. Right. So that's the closest one. And Neptune does contact a lot of planets in my chart, and there mm. it is opposed to the moon. So mom, again, right. um, I, I remember if I could do a brief anecdote. anecdote Please. Yeah. Was, and for those that don't know her, just if you want to introduce her, we did a whole episode yeah, on her did. at one point a yeah. few years ago. Maggie Nalbandian is my mother. Mm -hmm. uh, she started Astrology at All Bookstore in 1975. So mm -hmm. I started there at 16. Uh, she started um, NORWAC, the Northwest Astrological Conference, which I now own and run, she started that in 1984. Mm. And she started studying astrology when I was six, so 1965. Okay. And when I was a teenager, she said to me, she pulled me aside and said, I, out of the four of you, I'm worried most about you. Mm. <laughs> and I'm like, why is that, mom? All right. And she said, well, you have Neptune opposed the moon. And and I really feel like, you know, you've got to be careful of drugs. Mm. And, you know, this would be back in the 70s. What's really interesting is out of four siblings, I'm the only one that didn't. Okay. Right? Yeah. Well, you've got some nice counterbalancing like earth stuff yeah. going on, it seems yeah. like. And that's a lot of what's going on in your chart is a yeah. for those listening to the audio version, you have Leo rising and the sun in Capricorn along with Mercury and Saturn, and then the midheaven and the moon and Mars up in Taurus in the uh, 10th house. And uh, Pluto in Virgo over in the first or second house, depending on the house system. Right. Yeah. So a lot of Earth in your chart really oh. counterbalancing that Neptune helps. It does. Yeah. Okay. And and if you could think it conversely, that the Neptune counterbalances all that Earth. Yeah, that's a good point. That's right? a good way to look at it, actually. Yeah. Um, so, but she was very much into obviously astrology and yeah. metaphysics, and, yes. and in that way, sort of imported some of those things into your life. She did. She didn't do it overtly. I think at mm. that one moment, she probably did. Uh, mm. I started working in the bookstore when I was sixteen. Would come in after school. The bookstore wasn't too far from my high school, and I'd walk over and. I took my first class from her when I was 16, but you know, it was in the summer. I was bored. It was math. Right. Yeah. People are still calculating charts by hand and like yes. using clay tablets yeah. to write down. Apparently, yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. And right? it was like, really? I don't want to. Yeah, yeah. So the bookstore moved a couple of times. And in 1979, I think it was around there. I was working in the bookstore, didn't know what I, I'd graduated high school, didn't know what I wanted to do with my life. And my father knew this. And he came to me one day and he said, Your mom and I are firing you. Mm. If you this is a safe place for you. If you don't get out in the world to figure out what you want to do, you'll never do it. Mm -hmm. So you're fired, get out. Okay. So. <laughs> that was their version of kicking you out. Of, yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was it was good. I went out and did other things and mm -hmm. became a bookkeeper in an accounting firm, which for my left brain was fabulous and learned right. a lot about bookkeeping. And so that served me for business. Mm -hmm. Went back to the bookstore in 83, started studying astrology and other stories along the way about the circuitous route and how I became a professional astrologer, which wasn't the goal. Mm. Right. So, you know, there's a, a, but having a mom who was an astrologer you know, certainly was very different than every other kid that I grew up with. Uh, right. Stay home moms and yeah, that sort of thing. Especially being born in 59 and yeah. in terms of the generation then that, that raised you and like what their attitudes and like interests were that would have been very different and a much more like mystical bent than or spiritual bent than most, you know, parents in the 19. 60s and 70s. Mm -hmm. She she took us to church mm. on Sundays, not because she was religious, but she was very clear. Mom was very direct 
about her approach. And she said, I'm taking you to church because I want you to decide for yourself. Mm. I don't want to tell you what's right or what's wrong about religion. I want you to figure it out for yourself. Okay. And she was n- she never hid her astrology from church. The church ladies would come over and knock on the door while mom was at work and say that they were here to you know, pray for us mm. and pray for mom. Okay. She loved to go to the racetrack, the horse track. And again, she she didn't hide those things mm-hmm. and that she was into astrology. And, and we, we were very polite, but when they closed the door, we'd all just break out laughing because we 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 really thought it was you have to pray over mom. Right, this is ridiculous. Like they're afraid for her soul or yeah, something. Yeah, and She's our souls. Right, so you ra- know. wrapped up in all of these uh, occult practices and stuff. Yeah, and so yeah, we did for ourselves dis- discern and determine <clears throat> what we believed about religion, and so I think that was the better way. She didn't necessarily tell us we had to be anything. Hmm. Okay. Um, and I was just looking up what episode. So it's episode 75, which is on the Astrology Podcast website. If anybody wants to go back and look up that episode where we did a whole um, thing on her two hour discussion about her life. So that's a nice starting point and grounding in terms of your, your Neptune street cred and accolades. Because um, also you're a very practical per- person and you organize conferences. You've organized a bunch of conferences. You're doing the ESAR conference next year. You're doing the Northwest Astrology Conference, which you took over from your mom and became the head organizer of, I think, over what, 15, 10, 15 years ago. Um, but then you also do have like a very um, sort of internally a, a philosophical or spiritual sort of um, mindset to some extent, Correct. despite your very practical exterior. Absolutely. So it's practical spirituality. There's no question mm-hmm. about it. It has to be <clears throat> I have to find use for it. That doesn't mean it has to be, can I manipulate it with my hands, but I have to find some value for it and some use for it in my life, mm-hmm. right? So all things mystical and spiritual for me are actually quite practical in how I use astrology in my metaphysical and spiritual life from being a practicing Wiccan to you know all sorts of things. It's got to be grounded in some use and some value for me. Yeah, and your one of your primary backgrounds also is is in like evolutionary astrology. Is your would you say your primary approach? It is. I mean, it's what I was astrologically raised in, mm-hmm. in the sense of my education. Now, mom started out fairly traditional, learning from a local longtime astrologer, Dorothy B. Hughes, who had a bookstore. Yeah, I'm still like finding book used books uh, say, of Dorothy B. Hughes that she has this like yes. book book stamp. Yeah. And in used bookstores in Denver, I'm still finding yeah. books in circulation that used to be in her collection. Yeah, and you'll find books that have astrology at all stickers on them as well. Yeah. So so she started out in a very fairly traditional modern. I mean, the truly traditional elements really didn't come about until around the late 80s and 90s, but mm. traditional modern in that sense, along with Joanne Wickenberg and a number of Seattle astrologers. And it was Jeffrey coming into the bookstore in 76, Jeffrey Green. Mm. And uh, it, she had started to move into, prior to that, Dane Rujar, Alexander Ruperty. There was Mark Robertson in Seattle as well, who wrote um, Transit of Saturn. And mm. he wrote a book on phases and uh, a couple other books, I believe. Again, all very psychological astrologers. Gary Lawrenson was there at that time, who's mm. now since moved into a more mundane approach. But back then, they were all sort of of that same kind of outlook on astrology and life. And so, Mm -hmm. Jeffrey came also with um, uh, an interest in steeped in Dane Rujar, Rupert T. Um, uh, He was good buds with Robert Jansky and his work on aspects and phases and Mm -hmm. so on. And so, you know, out of that work and his own inspiration came evolutionary astrology and the use of Pluto as the method of looking at soul patterns. Where's the soul coming from? Mm-hmm. So I'm first educated in that. And that's my that's my passion. That's my love. That's my focus. I look at other forms of astrology. I've 
looked at perfections. I've looked at precessed solar returns. I've looked at tertiary. I've looked at solar arcs. Mm -hmm. You know, I've played with them and see how I can, you know, take methods and blend them into what I'm doing. If they don't really work for me, I'm 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 not using them. That doesn't mean that they aren't of use, mm -hmm. but they may not be of use for me. And so again, sure. everything comes down to is there use? Is it purpose? Does it have value? Does it have application in what I'm doing? Mm -hmm. So that's really it. That makes sense. Um, all right. So, in previously in this series, in order to sort of ground the discussion and, and to focus on the meaning of the planet, we've read some passages from different astrologers in order to see what people have said in the past that's been influential on how astrologers think today. So, I was trying to find a good um, book that would summarize some of the significations of Neptune, and I have a, a few of them. But one of them that I was going to read was. Richard Tarnas's um, one of his paragraphs on Neptune when he starts talking about the significations of the planet. Do you think that's a good starting point, or is relatively reflective of your views? Love Richard Tarnas. You know, he's a brilliant mind. He's a great man. Um, had hoped to have him at Norwalk for next year. Right. He's got a, a a reunion for college that he doesn't want to miss, so he won't be there. Okay. Well, maybe next time. Yep. Okay. For sure. Yes. So here's what he says, and he has like a long section on Neptune. So this is not going to be everything, but he does have um, a decent paragraph where he says Neptune is associated with the transcendent, spiritual, ideal, symbolic, and imaginative dimensions of life, with the subtle, formless, intangible, and invisible, with the uh, intuitive or unitive, I actually don't know what that word is, timeless, immaterial, and infinite, with all that which transcends the limited, literal, temporal, and material world of concretely empirical reality, myth and religion, art and inspiration, ideals and aspirations, images and reflections, symbols and metaphors, dreams and visions, mysticism, religious devotion, universal compassion. It is associated with the impulse to surrender separative existence and egoic control, to dissolve boundaries and structures in favor of underlying unities and undifferentiated wholes, merging that which has, um, yeah, merging that which was separate, healing and wholeness, the dissolution of the ego boundaries and reality, melted ecstasy, mystical union, and primary narcissism. With tendencies towards illusion and delusion, deception and self deception, escapism, intoxication, psychosis, perceptual and cognitive distortions, conflation and confusion, projection, fantasy, with the bedazzlement of consciousness, whether by gods, archetypes, beliefs, dreams, ideals, or ideologies, with enchantment in both positive and negative senses. Okay, I think we're done. Yeah, let's wrap it up. And uh, go yeah, home. let's go. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Luckily, I'm already at home, so I don't have far to go. <laughs> I'm like, that's it. Couldn't have said it. Pardon me. Couldn't have said it any better. Yeah. Well, he, he worked on that book for what, like 10 or 15 years or 20 years or something. So he, he put some thought into it. Um, but that's pretty good. And, and one of the things that it, does very well is capturing both some of the I don't know how to phrase it, but some of the upsides to Neptune mm -hmm. and some of the downsides potentially. Call it integrated, unintegrated, healthy, unhealthy, mm. um, shadow, light. I I I don't like hierarchical forms, and sure. that's a hierarchical form mm -hmm. that it tends to import judgment. Right. Still struggling to find the words that describe those things on their continuum because that right. is a continuum a spectrum of mm -hmm. manifestation every planet every sign every house everything has that right. spectrum of expression and so yes yeah of <laughs> he like, encompasses that definitely um so that'll be one of the things that'll be tricky for us in terms of this planet too because neptune obviously is a very slippery planet and nailing down its significations and articulating them can sometimes be difficult, but that's one of the primary difficult things is that it has those sometimes constructive manifestations and less constructive manifestations and everything in between. Absolutely everything in between, mm -hmm. right? And, and my intention in my astrology 
in my teaching and with clients is to not import judgment one way or the other mm. on the placement of that spectrum that they might be landing. And we land on all those spectrums can be moment to moment throughout our lives, whatever. Right. So some people get stuck in a place of what we might call the shadow of that in that spectrum, and they might get mm. stuck there. Mm -hmm. But I really work at not importing judgment into that position. Mm -hmm. It is it is natural and normal for us to judge or make judgments. There are healthy judgments we make, mm -hmm. right? And by and large, we as an astrologer, for me, I'll speak for me, I would much prefer my clients to be at another position on the spectrum. Mm -hmm. But my position also is that they are where they are for the reason they need to be. Mm. And as their astrologer, giving them advice or coaching them is to help show them the other part of the spectrum. Right. Right. And to not demonize where they're at, but mm. to show it as a continuum for their growth. Sure. And that they don't have to be stuck there and they don't have to judge themselves because certainly people who are, and those of us, all of us who have been in those, what we call the darker places of the Neptune spectrum, mm -hmm. we know we're there mm. unless we're truly in delusion. Yeah, which is tricky sometimes if you're in a heavy Neptune transit, it can seem very nice, but you can be in a sort of bubble or an illusory sort of bubble that oh, yes. it's not until you step outside of that transit that you look back and you realize like, oh, like I was in the middle of something that was not what it seemed, but I didn't quite realize it. Right. That is very clearly true in a transit, mm. right? And as an, uh, as a consulting astrologer, you for me, I want to make sure that I articulate the potentiality of being in that bubble mm -hmm. and not to judge oneself even as you get on the other side of that bubble because right. you're in the bubble for a reason. Yeah. I mean, I again, from a practical point of view, for me, it's practical to I don't I don't believe in the faded nature of the bubble, but we have a reason for being where we are. Mm -hmm. Right. And so, in the growth of our consciousness, and for me, in the growth of our soul, that's the place we land. And we have a multiplicity of choices in how we're going to deal with, again, that spectrum mm -hmm. of how we're going to deal with that transit. And then, as Neptune in the chart, we're going to have lots of options and choices. Sometimes they don't seem like it, but we do. Mm. We do have choices in terms of how we, where we go with that energy. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um so I'm trying to think of some of the things that he mentioned but just foundational principles to start with. One of them that I often think about is just Neptune as as illusion is like one of the main archetypal keywords that's often mentioned for Neptune is illusion which can be you know positive, negative, constructive, destructive. There's different ways that illusion can work and sometimes that term might get a bad rap initially but it has um positive connotations as well mm -hmm. my uh one of my old friends who passed away in 2010 or 2011 actually um Alan White from Project Hindsight he always used this analogy if he said when Neptune was first discovered um newspapers first started printing photographs from the civil war and people's jaw would drop because they would Point at it and look and say, "Look, you can actually see this scene. Like you're there um, in person, seeing this battlefield." And they were just shocked at at, at um, how uh, real it seemed to them. But then his point was always that it, that it's not real. That what it is is um, ink that's been sprayed on a piece of paper in a certain design in order to mimic or. Give you the illusion that you're actually looking at the real scene when in fact you're not. You're just looking at ink on a paper. And that was, um, I always thought, a really good analogy of what Neptune does sometimes in creating an illusion of something that seems real. And um, yeah, maybe that is a, is a sort of starting point, the illusory nature. I, I agree. And look, <laughs> Let me let me come back to some basic foundational stuff from EA that okay. that is part of my from evolutionary yeah, astrology. Evolutionary okay. astrology that's part of um my philosophical trajectory through astrology. Mm -hmm. So 
though we're not talking about Pluto, Pluto plays a, a role in, in, in Neptune in a way for okay. me. So Pluto representing the soul has two dueling desires. One is to separate from the source which created it, and one is the desire to merge with the source that created it. Mm. So Mars is the planetary function of the desire to separate, mm -hmm. right? Right. I, Aries, Mars, my will, I will, my desire, mm -hmm. right? Neptune is the function of the desire to merge and lose the separateness of self to merge with infinite source, divine consciousness, God, goddess, whatever universal intelligent, whatever you want to call that thing, mm -hmm. source. So Neptune is also the illusion or represents on one hand the illusion that we are separate mm. because the process of evolution of consciousness is to dissolve that illusion of separateness. So we're constantly dueling these desires within every human, the desire to separate, mm. the desire to establish I, the desire to fulfill ego, the desire, mm -hmm. and the dueling equal desire to connect, to be part of something, to merge, mm -hmm. to transcend. Yeah, to transcend one's own limited sort of ego and, and merge with something more, more collective right. as, as a basic impulse. Right. And so from um, a Buddhist point of view, which kind of comes into this, the nature of separating desires over the course of evolution of soul is that separating desires begin to fall away. It is for more the tantric version or the tantric path of Buddhism, which approaches enlightenment through desire. So that is through, the only way out is through. It's, it's through the nature of exploring desire that you begin to burn them out and leave them behind. So that the function of evolution is to leave those separating desires so that the only desire left is the Neptunian desire. So that ego becomes fulfilled, not dissolved. You actually are dissolving the illusion of self, but it also creates its wholeness. I hope that makes some paradoxical sense because yeah. It really is, um, think of it this way, that we come through, my belief is we come through, there's um, the ego is like a lens in which consciousness and soul and stuff is projected throughout into the world. On that lens is our karmic attachments and complexes and stories and traumas. And the course of one's lifetime through transits is like a big sanding sandpaper or diamond grit that's trying to grind off all of that schmutzy on the lens, all those attachments, all those stuff. Hmm. So those are part of the stuff that as ego gets projected through, it gets distorted. This is Neptune. <clears throat> gets distorted through those attachments, gets distorted hmm. through those, and those become the reality lens in which we focus on. So Neptune and the outer planets for me are part of including Saturn, part of this transit process of, the, of grinding away as we move through these um, transits we are dealing with stories that may come from our childhood or stories that transcend childhood and that dissolution of the the ego as separate mm. but the reason we get to the, e the the dissolution of ego as separate is that ego becomes clean and whole and through a healed and whole ego we are able to see our god self or to see god or to experience divine mm. so for me neptune is a primary function of that of that of what i just said that in terms of the evolution of consciousness and the evolution of soul okay what is that it makes it reminds me of that statement that rob hand would always make that Saturn is like reality uh, or something like that, or, or one's experience of reality, and then Neptune is one's realization that there is no reality or some, <laughs> exactly. something like that. Well, that's a perfect analogy because Saturn is an evolutionary astrology. Certainly, the the obviously it's the last planet we see with our yeah. with our eyes. So, so it so is the last visible planet, yeah. and then you can't see any other planets beyond that with the naked eye, right. even though they exist out there. Right. Yeah. So Saturn represents represents the limit of consciousness as we perceive it. It represents mm -hmm. our known reality. Everything beyond that is the unknown, mm -hmm. right? And so all of that then encapsulates Saturn's, what we might call dysfunctions and shadows around the fear of moving beyond what is known and then crystallizes what is known to stay safe. So Neptune, uh, Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto then represent the planets that are 
doing their job to, in some way, Neptune's job is to erode the falseness of one's perceptions of reality. Mm, right, because so if um, Saturn's last visible planet's the last thing that's um, visible in terms of the visible tangible world, then Neptune, by definition, because Uranus occasionally, like Stephen Forrest has mentioned this to me, that you can see it sometimes yes. with the naked eye under certain conditions, but mm -hmm. Neptune's the first planet where you just cannot see it with the naked eye. So therefore, there's something about it that does represent the intangible or that which cannot be seen, um, that which is hidden. And, and that's one of the reasons why it gets associated with the sort of spiritual or sort of transcendent sort of realms of reality. You kind of have to take it on faith in a mm, way right. if you didn't have a telescope. Yeah. If somebody like told you there's a planet out there, uh, you would just have to believe them until you, if you couldn't actually have the technology to witness it yourself. Right. I, I've never seen Neptune with my own personal eyes through mm. a telescope. So I, though I've seen photos, we know anything can be Photoshopped. So in a right. sense, you know, I'm taking in the word of astronomers and those who have seen it, and and there is a kind of faith-based element in that. And mm -hmm. so, where Jupiter for me is belief, Neptune for me is faith. It okay. transcends ego. Jupiter's an inner planet. It sits inside Saturn, so it's mm -hmm. part of our structured reality, mm -hmm. right? So it's ego to me, bound in what I believe to be true. Where Neptune has to transcend that, it goes beyond religion for me and goes into the spiritual realm. Okay, so maybe the difference between some people say, "I'm not religious, but I am spiritual." Correct. Sort of like a distinction there, yes. where maybe Jupiter, uh, which I did that episode yesterday with Sam Reynolds on Jupiter, and we talked a lot about Jupiter and religion, and Jupiter and um, law and morality and judgment, um, like mm -hmm. judges as a traditional association with Jupiter. Um, but here we're, we're talking about that not, um, it's not formalized into like a set of rules necessarily, but instead it's some sort of transcendent sense of that which transcends reality and that which is spiritual in some fundamental underlying sense. Right, because how could it be structured if Neptune represents the dissolution of all things, all things that are formed, mm. how could we then set a level of precepts and philosophies under the Neptune banner? Mm -hmm. It would have to be Jupiter's banner, which is about truth and beliefs and codified law and you know teaching of something of precepts, mm -hmm. right? So there is a level of belief that comes into Jupiter. I have to believe in that philosophy, but Neptune transcends that. Mm -hmm. Right, I it, that is a transcendental into some mystical, unformed place. It is for me um, staring into the eyes of the divine. Mm -hmm. Right, there is no minister or priest or codified book of religious precepts between me and that experience. Right, there's no middleman when it comes to Neptune. Neptune is uh, almost direct, sometimes revelatory experience of something transcendent. Absolutely, mm. absolutely. So this was where we get inspiration and imagination and visioning, it's vision quests. It's those moments of Neptunian clarity. And a moment of Neptunian clarity is very different than a Uranian clarity. Mm -hmm. Uranian clarity is a bolt of lightning lighting up the dark. Neptune's clarity is like standing in the fog in the mountains or on the edge of the water. Mm. And it's cloudy or foggy. You know, you're just in it. You can't see anything. Again, you have to take on faith that the water is there mm. because it distorts sound. It distorts light. Sound, water distorts, right? We know the principles, the physical principles of water. There's a distortion element. So in a way, we have to, we're called to use different perceptionary tools than what we can see and what we can hear, mm. right? So when that fog bank begins to clear, it's slow, right? Right, And you see less and less fog, less and less fog, less and less, and then... The sky is just blue and everything is crystal clear. Right. That's that kind of revelatory clarity that Neptune represents, that moment of, of, of almost as if the fog um, drifts away, that the angels are singing and the trumpets sound. You know, it's like this awe-inspiring. And you heard me taking my breath. That's inspiration, breathing in the breath of the divine. 
right? That's that inspirational. You're just inundated with the images of the blue and the colors, and it's divine. Right. Um, so that reminds me, uh, in terms of like sudden exposure and dis- di- dissolution of reality and dissolving of reality, we keep using the term dissolving. Somebody on Twitter posted like the first, um, the scientist who first um, developed LSD and the exact time that that was he first took it. And I think Neptune was like right on the ascendant or something like that. Yeah, I thought that was a really great example. Yeah, astrology doesn't work, does it? No. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I really <laughs> like that because so that's another one of example of, of suddenly being aware and like transported to a different world mm-hmm. where you realize, you realize that. Um, for for a time at least, while doing that, I guess theoretically, from what I read in books, that it you, you know you're suddenly exposed to different um, type of reality where your senses have been changed and where um, color and sound and, and touch and all of those things that we take for granted and we're used to suddenly have a very different sense and a very different feeling uh, suddenly. Yeah, and that you know that is a. Um So for me, I'm not anti-drug. Sure. Back in the 70s, you know, I did my my thing. Okay. All right. So without details. So um, it is, a, though I've never done LSD. Okay. Uh, somehow I knew with a Neptune on the nadir opposed the moon and multiple aspects to Neptune that it probably wasn't a good idea. Yeah. And because what you're doing is... Mm, Externally or artificially, and I don't mean artificial in the sense that you can do use organic elements and natural elements to do it, but you're you're artificially jump starting the Neptune process. So it happens a bit more rapidly mm-hmm. than say the Neptune function on its own. Because if we think about the nature of water mm-hmm. and Neptune, its function is slow. Mm-hmm. Right, you see the Grand Canyon. You see what water does, dripping on rock over time consistently. Right, water wins over rock. Water wins wins over earth mm-hmm. consistently, unless you dam it up, right, and put more of a force against water mm-hmm. to um, resist it. Right, but water over time will erode concrete. You know, it's just it's going to so. I get concerned a little bit. I'm not judgmental about it at all, but I get a little concerned about um, jumpstarting that process a little too quickly, particularly if an ego, the ego structure, is not ready for that. Right. Yeah. Sometimes um, prominent Neptune can indicate sometimes like a longing for like otherworldly experiences or transcendent experiences, and sometimes. The downside can be that sometimes people can get stuck um, with shortcuts, which can be things like like drugs or or alcohol or other sort of addictive behaviors. Sex, sure, like anything sure. that can be addictive, addictive, or that can give um, some sort of alternative, mm-hmm. like experience of reality or almost experience of something transcendent, and that can be very addicting. Well, that comes back to what I said about the dueling desires within the soul. Neptune represents the desire to merge, mm. right? Desire to merge. And that's a good word for Neptune, right? To dissolve boundaries, to merge. Mm. And in a very separated world or the illusion of a separated world, mm-hmm. if we come back to that word illusion and thinking about that ink on the paper, it's an illusion of a separation. And Neptune's le- process is to dissolve the illusion, to dissolve the veil. Mm. So, you know, I, I, Evolution to me wins. If I think of one fate in the world, that, that's evolution, right? It's just going to happen. Mm. And, and maybe the jump starting of it is part of the process. Again, I don't have judgments about that, but you can get thrown into something the ego structure isn't prepared to see mm. or deal with. And you can get yourself in a, a world of trouble. And then you can use that as a form of escapism right. without really doing the work. And so the desire to merge with something can be done again at a full spectrum mm. of behavior, right? So the desire to merge through sex, the desire to merge through drugs, the desire to connect to something 
and um, the ego structure too fearful to make that leap for itself. Mm. I mean, any, I mean, that's just one narrative about it, but it can be for any number of reasons. And we do know that Neptune also represents the escapist tendency, the, the denial process to escape from one reality to another, to escape one's moment and to, to skip off into another. And that can be through imagination, but Again, imagination, inspiration, illusion, all of these have functions that serve our growth mm -hmm. and they are not to be denied either. Yeah, or even like like dreams, like the necessary component that it, it's like you will go crazy if you don't sleep and go into a deep enough sleep that you dream and just the otherworldly sort of experience of having dreams and whatever that is and wherever we go when we have dreams, but that feeling of um transcending things and being able to do anything or have any sort of different experience um through the the dream state. It's fantastic. Yeah. Right. And and so when we think about insanity and crazy, that's that's Neptune too for mm. me. You know, that's the the that's part of its spectrum of you know the insanity falls on the in spectrum uh, the spectrum of neptune mm -hmm. all the way up to enlightenment and connection to god sure so in terms of like maybe being stuck in a alternative or, or or even false reality or something like that sure okay absolutely but you know escapism imagination um denial all have their functions they all serve us in some way mm. there is nothing that humans have ever created that wasn't imagined or envisioned somewhere mm -hmm. right we have to we have to see it somehow we have to have inspiration for it before it becomes manifest so this that's and then if we are in if a child's in a in poverty or in a horrible situation or um, a person is in a horrible relationship where they feel they can't get out. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the only way out in living that reality is to imagine and they escape to their imaginary world. Right. Right. So we can get stuck in dead end jobs where we are fearful of leaving because it gives us insurance and a 401k or it gives us that sense of consistency and it's not rocking the boat, but it's dead, right? Mm -hmm. And yet they, we might go to work and sit at our computer or whatever it is we're doing, counting beans and imagine ourselves like, I don't know, some of you might be too young, but Walter Mitty, mm -hmm. you know, the secret life of Walter Mitty. Uh, imagining yourself somewhere in the world doing some heroic thing or some wildly creative thing. And that's what dreams do for us as well, is what you're saying. It's a place where we become untethered mm -hmm. from the bounds of reality. And dreams are a place where we can do anything that our consciousness and unconsciousness can possibly imagine. Mm -hmm. So it is the it, it, it serves the ego structure in the way to untether itself from its world to experience. It also serves as a way of processing, you know, our daily lives and mm. working things out. I mean, the dreams serve, they are fundamental to our very survival, as you say, mm -hmm. right? It's interesting that, because I, I often think of like Uranus as the liberatory planet that's associated with like freedom and especially mm -hmm. like sudden, unexpected, mm -hmm. even like violent um, overthrows of one's restrictions in order to achieve freedom and liberation. But freedom, it sounds like freedom is like another component here that we're talking about underlying some of this stuff with Neptune, that it's like giving you access to a realm where you have way more freedom than you do in the in the real, quote unquote, real world. And there's a, a freedom component to that in some sense. I've never actually thought of that, maybe in some other languaging of that but i agree 100 mm. percent because you are untethered right you are untethered from the bounds of physics mm. physical law uh limitations of mental perceptions of what you know of anything right right in my dream i could walk through that wall in this dream i could levitate you know in a dream i could do anything be anywhere in the universe right and there's something that's like healing or or necessary that component to have that in certain doses in one's life whether it's through like reading a book, reading like fiction and being transported to a different world, or even movies like film is a very Neptunian very much. thing. Because um, I was reading something about like film theory recently about how important 
suspension of belief is when you're watching a movie that you have to be able to suspend belief. And it's actually the effectiveness of the movie is partially dependent on how well this, the filmmaker can create a world that is believable, no matter how weird stuff is in that world, <laughs> but that the person can immerse themselves in it and, for, and contemporarily sort of forget about um, not believing certain components of the narrative yeah. or what have, have to, you. They have to buy in. Yeah, they have right? to buy in. Yeah, they have to buy in and they have to go along with the imaginative narrative. Mm. Right. That's yeah. that they have to step in. They have their movies and books, music and art mm. are an invitation to step into somebody else's imaginal world. Right. Right. Um, again, some of your audience may be too young for this, but if you have haven't read Jonathan Livingston Siegel, it's an old book. I'm just forgetting the author. It's one of the first books I read at 16. It's fiction, mm. it was in the bookstore. Uh, it was. It is. Um, it is from the view of Jonathan Livingston Seagull. It's a seagull, okay, right? And the metaphysical perceptions that Jonathan has, mm -hmm. and one of the sections in the book is about movies and the suspension of belief and imagination and what movies we are drawn to uh, in terms of. The choices that we make, for instance, if your genre is horror movies, or if you prefer uh, romance, or comedies, or sci-fi, or documentaries, you know. So uh, I love books like that. I mean, I've read a lot of straight psychology, um, spiritual, metaphysical, but I love I love stories that are that are fiction that mm. bring in those concepts. Um, Jane Roberts' work from Seth, which is a tough read, but wrote books that were fiction. Um, the Education of Oversoul Seven. It mm -hmm. was another book I read uh, when I was young in the bookstore. Mm -hmm. uh, another fiction I found just a few years ago was The Art of Racing in the Rain by another Seattle author who the book is spoken through and is through the eyes of the dog, Enzo, and how he wants to incarnate next lifetime as a human. And the metaphysical principles that are brought into that are, again, you have to suspend your belief that a dog is talking and writing a book right. and is going to incarnate as a human at some point. Mm -hmm. You have to suspend your belief and open your imagination to a seagull um, and its perceptions of the world, just as you have to um, you're invited into the imaginal world by a writer and a director. Uh, so yes, yeah, that's Neptune. And you have to sort of um, understand and accept that there. It's like you have your reality, but that in this world or in this alternative reality, like this is the these are the rules there, and this mm -hmm. these are how the rules are different compared mm -hmm. to the real world. Like. Um, you know, there's or the real world as we see it, <laughs> right? Well, I was, I was thinking about like the fantasy books as a genre, like uh, the Chronicles of Narnia yeah. or um, Lord of the Rings, Lord of the Rings. or um, more recently Game of Thrones, and how like in you know that world, like dragons are a thing that exists, yeah. or like elves and other talking lions, and yeah, in the the Chronicles of Narnia, and which I loved and my children loved. You know, yeah, you have you're you are invited into that world mm -hmm. and you don't have to accept the invitation but if you're drawn into it then there is that place where for some of us we can see and hear the animals talking and feel the snow falling and mm -hmm. all of the things a book gives you the place to get the visual element when you're in a movie it's given to you right right mm -hmm. so they build more of that illusional world that imaginative world gets fleshed out for you to be to more readily buy in gives you all the textures and the sounds and colors and all that where reading a book the the better authors are able to draw you in mm -hmm. and give you that as well so that you enter into their world that you walk through the wardrobe in Narnia uh, in the in the closet and get to the other side that you get on Hogwarts train and you know the whole that's the you're being invited into that world right yeah um i like that so we're talking a lot about the um saturn versus neptune dynamic and the differences between those but it's also Making me think of the Mercury Neptune dynamic also when we're talking about fiction and like fiction authors. And that could be one positive, like upside to or constructive use of like Mercury Neptune combinations, let's say, is having 
a knack for sometimes building or communicating like imaginary worlds. Um, if you were like a f- fantasy author, that would be a great. Without question. And for me, Neptune in the third, mm. even hard angles, Neptune, Mercury, Neptune, Mercury opposition, any of them, squares, trines, quincunxes, any of those mm-hmm. can produce that. That's the degree in which you are allowing yourself that Mercury is allowing itself to be open to Neptune, right? So through the sextile, Certainly, the invitation is there, and they're communicating more clearly. And Mercury's like, "Hey, Neptune, mm-hmm. yeah, let's go there." Where possibly with an opposition or a square, Mercury might be a little bit more fearful and locked into its reality, depending on its sign and, and Neptune's sign. So, mm-hmm. right, but they're still there, mm-hmm. right? And the potential is always there for opening up to the imag- imaginative world, whether you put your uh, pen to paper or fingers to computer keys. Uh, or pen to paper to draw what's coming through that is certainly there yeah um so that's the let's say constructive th- version of that there's also a more challenging version of mercury neptune because <laughs> mercury more than anything its primary function is just communication whereas neptune one of its primary functions is like illusion or creating a alternative realities. And sometimes when you put those together, they almost become antithetical because Mercury's attempt to communicate something clearly gets a little foggy. And, and at the worst case scenario, that can be um, conveying something that's not true, true or that's that's false. That is false. Right. And so, uh, so here you have linear left brain Mercury, mm. right? So we know it's left brain, it's logic, it's deductive. It is one plus one equals two, mm-hmm. right? We we get from point A to point B, right? It is carrying information through our synapses and we then are speaking and transporting information and on ideas to somebody else and then receiving that information. Mm-hmm. Neptune doesn't work that way. right? I mean, it really is, and to your point, quite antithetical. It is... It is intuitive, it is inductive, it is circuitous, it is imaginative, it is Mm nonlinear, right? So when you find Mercury, Neptune in particularly stressful aspects, you can in in fact find someone who either A, knows the distinction between what's true and what's not and goes with what's untrue, Or you find someone who cannot distinguish the difference between what is true and what is not, and they just, their imaginal world or delusory world or illusory world just becomes their reality. Mm -hmm. Um, I have a sibling, a younger female sibling, who, in my opinion, has, and I I have erased her chart from my head, so um, I can't tell you. So, but she has a very difficult time. distinguishing I, I think she whatever she's communicating she sees as reality mm. even though from one minute or one moment to the next or one day to the next they might contradict one another right and so I don't think she particularly knows um, the distinction and what is real and what is not mm-hmm. I, I, that's not to say all the time that she's delusion delusional but I do believe that comes in and I believe illusion is a place where we know, we're an illusion for the most part. Mm -hmm. And delusion then goes into that place where we don't know that our illusions aren't real. So then you get pathological levels of a delusion. Right. Right. Yeah. Which, which is tricky and yes, not to get like all all political, but it was one of the fascinating things watching like Trump's rise Mm -hmm. and and presidency was just, he has that pretty tight Mercury Neptune square Mm -hmm. and you could see the ways in which he like uh, could use that sometimes to his advantage in order to be able mm-hmm. to um, make a very compelling narrative um, rhetorically using that Mercury, but then also sometimes in terms of like the fact checkers and just you know seeing the media try to keep up with like whether what he was saying was true or false from on a day to day basis mm-hmm. was almost comical at times because it, yeah, yeah it was it was bizarro world to be honest right and I do believe now that I'm trying to call her chart up that she has a Neptune Mercury square. Okay. Yeah. So uh, I've always likened her to our former president in in a way. But here's the thing is that you can have a Neptune Mercury trine with no, nothing stopping you energetically Mm -hmm. from a trine point of view uh, to stop you from spewing 
mistruths as well and being quite good at it. Mm. Same with a sextile, right? So the square, it was um, so many years ago, Aaron Sullivan was doing a lecture at Norwalk. It would have been back in the 80s probably mm -hmm. and or 90s. And she gave an analogy about aspects where she said, if you take light and ref um, refract it through a prism at 90 degrees, that that's a square, that the light will stay trapped in the prism, building tension. Mm. But if you refract light at 120 degrees, which is the trine, that the light goes through unimpeded from the prism. Mm. So I always think of, that was a great analogy for me. And, and you know, thinking about trines as, I don't think about trines as good and squares as bad. Again, there's a spectrum for everything. Mm -hmm. So the the dysfunctional or unhealthy manifestations or a trine is that there's nothing stopping us from doing bad behavior. Right, that you could be really good at it. Absolutely. Right, okay. Um, I'm thinking of, it's making me think of a funny quote from like Seinfeld where George Costanza is talking to Jerry and he, he has this line, he says, it's not a lie if you believe it. And that, right. and that's it's something that sticks with me as a, as a nice like Mercury Neptune thing is sometimes yeah. there's a ambiguity because the person themselves sometimes actually believes that thing even if like objectively it's actually a lie in that moment the person actually believes it just as much as they're trying to convey it to the other person and that's one of the weird ambiguities sometimes with very close Mercury Neptune combinations right and so if you say it with confidence mm -hmm. you say it enough and you make it big enough. Right, you know the big lie. Mm -hmm. How could it not be true? Right, and right? and on some level, it's like you yourself have bought into it. And you've yeah. convinced yourself. Yeah. So that brings us to the um, sort of self delusion part of Neptune sometimes, which can be a downside, which mm -hmm. is a tendency sometimes to want to talk yourself into certain realities and to want to believe in something, and sometimes it being hard to check yourself to get an, an external sort of view of whether what you're buying into is actually <laughs> true or not. Uh, yeah. Uh, I often say to clients, uh, heading into clear Neptune cycles, mm. you know, conjunction, square, opposition, that it might not be easy for them to see what's going on, mm -hmm. to check in with somebody you seriously trust. Sure. Right. And I got to say, under my Neptune Venus transit, I had, uh, this was, would have been back in Neptune transit in Aquarius. Okay. And it was, I can't believe, I can't remember. I know that Neptune over my sun was five transits. Neptune over Mercury was probably five transits. I don't believe it was five to Neptune. Hmm. That would have been just too much, I think. But I was in a relationship that was clearly on the, when I got to the other side of it, was that bubble, mm. right? And my after I got on the other side of it, friends came up to me and said, oh my God, I'm so glad you're out of that mm. because we did not like him. And I'm like, where were you right. when I'm in the middle of this? And then I had to stop and ask myself, all right, if they had said something, what would- How would, would I, you have reacted? Would I have believed them? Because the illusion is so real. Right. Right, the the experience of being swept away, of being, of that transcendent what appeared or ex what I thought I was experiencing was transcendent love, hmm. right? It was mystical. It was sw swept away into this thing. Right. Would I have believed them? No, probably not. Not during the middle of the transit. Usually, right. a person is so committed to that version of reality that it's very hard to break them out of it, and that can come up with other things like. You're talking about Venus Neptune relationships, but also like religious cults and things like that. And like the worst case scenario of believing in a a religion or a, a revelatory experience that somebody else has had, or finding a guru figure who, if you're going through really intense transit, may not be later all they're cracked up to be. Right. And so the ego doesn't want to come to that mm -hmm. until it has to. Right. right. And then it then this is where I come back to clients and say, you know, if you get on the other side of this mm. and you're not, you haven't, you aren't able in the process to hear from somebody you trust, mm. right? And you get on the other side of this, or you're now on the other side of this in recrimination, this is the place for the big C word in Neptune, and that is compassion, mm. right? And that is that place where, for me, ultimate compassion is divine grace, where you give yourself the space, forgiveness as. One of my students who's a therapist said to me, forgiveness is for giving space to that which already has occurred. Mm. 
Okay. Because we go into denial or in the regret process or the self-recrimination process of saying, God, I wish that hadn't occurred. Why did I do that? Mm. How could I have been so foolish? How could I have been so stupid? Right. So when we come to a place of acceptance, that doesn't mean I accept it and and I didn't I don't have some level of regret, but I have to give space for what has occurred. Mm. And that's compassion, where I get that grace, where I say, okay, that did occur. Those were the choices I made. This was the place I went. I'm on the other side of that. Instead of living in regret and pounding myself on this, do I have compassion and grace to look at it and say, what do I take from that? Right. How do I, you know, what is truth transcendent? Did I trans, am I able to transcend beyond that? And am I able to transcend beyond the desires and patterns that led to that place? Mm -hmm. Right. Right? So compassion, grace, um, uh, unconditional acceptance, the true grace of the divine, the true love of divine transcends, you know, Neptune is the higher octave of Venus. Mm -hmm. You know, we have human love with attachments and expectations and all that. And Neptune is something that transcends all of that. Right. Yeah. Um, that makes sense. So we're, we've talked about Saturn, Neptune. We talked about Mercury, Neptune, and we're talking about Venus, Neptune now. And um, yeah, sometimes just being in love with the idea of of being in love, and um, as a as a natal placement or or as a transit, sometimes just finding that person and, and falling in love and thinking they're like the best person in the world, and it's it's a too good to be true type scenario. Except in in the moment, you sort of <laughs> think that it is true. Um, but it's hard, a little hard to snap out of that because your suspension of disbelief when it comes to relationships or romance tends to be, um, you, you tend to suspend your disbelief pretty quick. Right. And again, if I may, I'm going to come back to those do, that dueling desire nature mm. of Pluto. And with Neptune's desire to merge, one of the ways, one of the primary ways that we try to accomplish that merging with source is through relationship. Mm. Seeing the divine in other or seeing our path to connection or wholeness. You know, the fantastical, there's a good Neptune word, the fantastical Mm. narratives are you complete me, the two hearts coming together that are broken. Nobody completes us. We are complete. And that is ultimately the Neptune function is to dissolve the limitations of consciousness, to dissolve the false perceptions. Neptune never wants to dissolve anything that is useful. Mm. It only dissolves that which is false, the illusion of separateness, the illusion that we buy into in the moment that is not serving our consciousness, nor is it serving our soul's path. Mm -hmm. So in that desire to seek divine or divinity in our partner, to make that ultimate connection that transcends the mind and so that my partner can read my mind and complete my sentences and do all those things that were of one mind and one heart. Those are fantastical visions and fantastical Mm -hmm. narratives that lead us into the kinds of relationship process of unrealistic expectations via Neptune. That's unrealistic. And think about the signs that Venus and Neptune rule in modern. Mm -hmm. So Neptune rules Pisces, Venus rules Libra. Those two signs are quincunx. They are 150 degrees from one another. Mm -hmm. There is tension between those. That that expectation that we have of our relationships via Libra and the unrealistic expectations we have via Neptune Mm -hmm. and the disconnect that often happens in the quincunx as we're trying to reach divine through a human being. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. And so in many spiritual t- traditions, the ancient traditions, there's something called the spiritual union, the spiritual marriage. And that is seeking the divine within, right? It is, it is seeing, um, meeting the Godhead face to face, is face. It is seeing and, and experiencing the divine other within self so that you're not projecting the, the distorted divine into the partner to meet for you, to fulfill for you, mm. only to become disillusioned, to be dissatisfied. All Neptune functions when we've elevated this in this fantastical way, Venus-Neptune um, uh, contacts in the chart put our partner on a pedestal 
in a way that could never be sustained. Right. And then the other person tries to live that false reality because they want it so bad. Then they, in a way, live a false reality, lie to us as well mm. in order to meet that expectation, which will never be sustained. Yeah. You mentioned uh, disillusionment. That's a really good point because sometimes when the person with the heavy Neptune thing is coming out of the Venus Neptune relationship. Um, the initial stage is idealization and sometimes either not seeing the partner for who they really are or even projecting a false image onto the partner. But then at some point, once reality starts seeping in, there can be this opposite extreme of then disillusionment and treating the person as being worse or more evil than they actually are. Right, demonizing the person versus taking accountability for mm. where you were at in the process, right? So, sure. you know, that was a shared reality or the person engaged in again, they in a way, <laughs> this is the first time I'm going to say this out loud. Yeah. In a way, we are all our own movie. Mm. And when we're in a relationship, we either step into somebody else's imaginal world of what that relationship will be or they're going to step into ours or they may duel. Mm. Right. And sometimes we step into somebody else's imaginal reality of the relationship and really try to live up to it. Right. Right. And yeah. and that falseness and the expectations that are projected on us or the relation the expectations we I mean, completely unrealistic expectations that we place on our partners. Mm -hmm. I mean, that in a way, I think about it when I was young. So I'll take this in a first person. I think about how sad it must have been for my partner, my first husband, to live in a world where I expected him to be somebody else. Mm. Right. And to not be able to live up to that or to- Yes, both of them. Sure. That I wasn't seeing him for who he really was, so sadness on that. Right. And then the sadness of, or the frustration of not living up to his expectations. He had Neptune in the seventh. Mm, okay. So. Yeah, so he had expectations that I tried to enter into I have a Neptune Venus square. He tried to enter into my expect they were never going to work. It was mm. never it's never going to work anyway. Right. We hung in there long enough, but you know, it's it's but the disappointment and disillusionment can lead to they misled me. Mm. That's the problem. Right. Yeah, and the question of how much cuz sometimes people genuinely are not what they seem and can put on a oh, false absolutely. facade. So it's like people absolutely. under, you know, Neptune transit or something, mm -hmm. let's say can meet up with somebody who's deceiving them in relationships or vice versa. It can be that um, you're the one, the, the person is the one that's actually creating a false reality by projecting things that are not true about this person and just not seeing them for who they are, but it's not the other person's fault necessarily. Yes, exactly. I agree. And then, then you can get variations on this. Let's say you have Neptune in the seventh. You got Neptune Venus contacts. Mm -hmm. You know, you may even have in modern astrology the Venus in the twelfth. You may have Venus and Pisces, hmm. right? So some variation, but let's call let's stick to Neptune in the seventh and Neptune Venus context. You may be drawn to a, a, a relationship. And let me set the premise for this. Um, Neptune Venus folks have the, in my opinion, the ability to see the highest good in other people, hmm. right? They they can transcend. The limitations of ego reality and see their highest good. Sure. And then what they can do is live in that expectation. But then what they can do is attract somebody who is really unhealthy. They've got addiction problems. They've got something that they're attracting. Venus, mm -hmm. Neptune in the seventh, they're attracting. And then they do this full on sacrifice thing to try to elevate this person up to their highest ideal. And so they want to save the other person. Yes, they want to save the other person. Okay, and um, it's ego driven in many ways. There are past patterns and complexes that come into this from an evolutionary astrology point of view, but there's still ego in this that I can save you, mm. right? And so again, the other person is very rarely capable of living up to that because they have their own path. Whether that's sure. the stay in the addiction pattern or the dysfunctional Neptunian kind of world that they're in or whether to arise from it has nothing to do with the other person, mm. right? Or they may even try to elevate themselves to the idealistic view that the other person has, but they may not be able to sustain it. So mm. again, falling off the pedestal, the disillusionment, the disappointment, all of that, right. uh, you know, wash, rinse, repeat. <laughs> so it's part of the compa compassion function of Neptune as part of that of a, a person that's 
got a prominent Neptune or is tied in with relationships might feel great compassion for other people and a desire to want to genuinely help them out, but sometimes can get themselves involved in, in situations that can be tricky as a result of that. So you get this enmeshment thing, right? Mm. You become over enmeshed, over sympathizing, over empathizing. And really, in a way, again, ego driven, you, you know, you. Again, the other side of the quincunx to Pisces in the twelfth house is Leo, mm. so you know there's some ego dynamics in here that I can save you, and that um, this is my job, or you know whatever narrative might come about. Mm -hmm. But you know the 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 compassion piece is so important. There, I, I'm empathy is important. The loss of empathy is something I fear in our culture, hmm. right? In our world, this loss of empathy, right. the loss of the ability to sympathize and resonate with somebody else's pain or position or thought. Hmm. This does not mean you have to buy into it. You don't have to agree with it. That's not what empathy and sympathy is about. It's being able to just step into somebody else's world, again, suspend disbelief for a moment and walk into their imaginal world. Right. And then you can step out again, hmm. right? So. Compassion for me, as I've recognized toxic behaviors from a sibling to other friendships, is to be able to have compassion for where they're at. And compassion involves non judgment, but it then comes down to a steely eyed assessment, a uh, judgment, not a judgment of them, a judgment of the situation and a mature recognition of where I'm at. So Saturn comes into play. There's a number of different planets in play here by those words. And to be able to have the maturity and compassion to say, Yes, I accept where you're at, but I'm not playing with you. I'm not stepping into your toxic world. Right. Right. So I can then, compassion means I have compassion for me as well. I'm not willing to sacrifice myself. I'll toss you the life ring, mm -hmm. but I'm not going down yeah, for you. That it's not necessary to, to sacrifice yourself in order to save everyone, uh, even though sometimes that tendency can be there that desire to do that can can be part of neptune absolutely and 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 there's lots of scenarios i'm not talking about being cold hearted by mm. any stretch but sometimes that life ring is going into a pool of 3 inches of water mm. and they think they're drowning right right so and and they want to stay there in the 3 inches of water that's their comfort zone mm -hmm. of thinking that 3 inches of water is an ocean that's about to sink them right right and then there are those you know that pull at your heart right and children and animals and where they may not have the choice consciously to make or the ability to change and we are called to take action hmm. but understanding the limitations of those actions is also important and having compassion for self knowing that there's only so much we can do right right so you know, it, understanding the compassion and having boundaries, Saturn, having those boundaries mm -hmm. is important, but we don't want to be cold and calculating and and turned off to the pain of the world. Right. Yeah. And figuring out the boundaries between those two, like most Neptunian things is kind of murky. Um, so I did want to pull out in the series we've been using um, Stephen Forrest's book, The Inner Sky from I think 1988. Um, but I wanted to read his Neptune passage really quickly because he has different um, categories of like function, dysfunction, question uh, to ask mm -hmm. yourself. So he says, uh, function of Neptune is the decentralization of ego in self imagery, the creation of a point of self observation external to ego, the weakening of the barrier separating conscious from unconscious, ego from soul, the development of an awness of what May, what may call be called God, uh, dysfunction, confusion, laziness, daydreaming, spaciness, escapism, drifting, drug and alcohol dependence, poor reality testing, testing, and glamorous delusions. That's a good one. Mm -hmm. um, key question: Where must I learn to de-emphasize logic and to function intuitively? Mm -hmm. Where is narrow self-interest most appropriate and destructive to me? That was what we were just talking mm -hmm. about. Where am I most vulnerable to mistaking wishes and fears for reality? Mm -hmm. so that's a that's a good it's one. Fantastical thinking, right? Right. So he used a good another C word for Neptune, and that's confusion. Yeah, confusion. Right, and it's it's a necessary function, mm -hmm. right? Just as denial and the process of dissolution are necessary functions of Neptune, but that's what is a 
confusion is a byproduct of dissolution, mm. right? And so, you know, it's it's what I thought was real is no longer real. Then that space of confusion, oh my God, how far back does that go? Right. Right. So one of the things that I find with students over time is that they say, Neptune's so confusing. Mm. No, 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 Neptune's not confusing. Neptune's confusion. Mm. So we don't need to submerge into confusion in order to understand confusion. It's right. just a word that describes place or an attitude or a function or a space. Mm -hmm. And we need, we need to understand that, right? Neptune seems so nebulous. No, it rules nebulousness. Mm. It seems so unformed. No, it rules unformed. Mm. Right. Right. So there's that sort of my earth getting in in there to give some distinction. Yeah, we can get lost in that. Mm -hmm. Right. That's a, a place that we can go and build a house in Confusionville. <laughs> right. It's just right. a place we want to pass through. It's not a place we want to stop and spend a whole lot of time. Right. And you know, we talked about insanity, if I can switch a bit. Um, if you want to, although be careful because there's a whole like debate about <laughs> astrology and mental illness and okay. the appropriateness of like You're astrologers correct. getting into that. And it's like And I don't believe let's talk let's not talk about clinical mm -hmm. uh, psychology, because I'm not a clinical psychologist. Right. The simple everyday kind of places where we go where we say that's insane. Sure. Yeah. Right. The the kind of insanity where we do the same thing over and over again and expect different results. Okay. All right. So that's where I'm going. Mm -hmm. Not clinical. I'm not educated, qualified, trained to talk about that. I may have opinions of it, but I am not trained to talk about it. Sure. Right. So the simple kinds of places where we go where, you know, we slip into a fantastical insane moment. Mm. Or we say, God, that was insane. How did I do that? Mm. You know, where where that was an awe-inspiring insanity. Oh my God, how did I manage to get, you know, that was really cool. Or, oh my God, how did I get there? Right. Right. So those kinds of uses of the word. And I think of, and I do talk to clients about a Neptune transit is like building a sand castle at the edge of the ocean mm. and coming back every day and finding it gone and building it again in the same place right? to have it dissolved again and again mm. and again. So Im impermanence? Impermanence. Okay. Yeah, that's a good one. Or it makes me think of the um, what the Buddhist pro uh, process or practice of making like a mandala in sand. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and then it creates this like beautiful pattern, and it takes like days or weeks or months to create, and very painstaking. And then they just erase, erase it, it away. immediately after. Right. So that is the beauty of the recognition of impermanence. Mm. Right. That is that is like full on embracing in physical reality the dynamics of impermanence. Mm -hmm. Right. So building your sandcastle on the edge of the ocean of the sea, knowing that the tide's going to come in and expecting your sandcastle to be there the next day, being disillusioned and disappointed that it's there and then rebuilding it in the same place. Mm. Right. Right. Yeah. That's, um, I'm thinking of that in different ways, like the Venus Neptune aspect and just relationships. <laughs> and like per a person can do that process of going through that same thing mm -hmm. of like, Oh my God, I found the one and they're my soulmate and mm. we're going to be together forever. And we've been together in past lives. And then <laughs> it turns out that it's like actually not a great relationship. And then it goes away. And then they meet the next person. They're like, Oh my God, this person is the one mm. and we're soulmates. And this is really it this time. And then it doesn't work out. And then they move to the next one. And so there's a, that's what I think of when you, when you mentioned that. Yeah. There, yeah. And there's so many ways to use that and apply that analogy of building your sandcastle mm. at the edge of the ocean with the waves coming in. You see them. Right. You see them, and then you have real-time results the next day. The sandcastle's gone. Mm -hmm. It's been washed away, and you rebuild it, yeah. thinking that this, the ocean's not going to come back, and that was yesterday. This is the one. Or, this is the camp. Or, or, or maybe sometimes, maybe the under overarching me message is that sometimes we need that. Like sometimes we need something to believe in because for some people that helps keep us going and that brings mm -hmm. a sort of um, energy and meaningfulness into life that 
even if on some level subconsciously you know it's not real or you know that the sand castle is going to be gone mm -hmm. tomorrow morning in the moment like that feels good and that's that feels right and feels sure. necessary Absolutely. for you to enjoy that right and i think again without judgment but the question then becomes for a client who's frustrated in that moment, yeah. frustrated with that cycle, to use a visual analogy mm -hmm. to say, isn't it rather like building your sandcastle at the edge of the ocean mm -hmm. and coming back every day to find it gone and then building it again? Right. Right. So that spins them into, you know, gives them an image, or I might use a metaphor, or I might use, I mean, all kinds of things that might stimulate imagination and mind to get in there and think about something differently. Mm -hmm. If I can get my client to come back and say, or even say in real time in the session, wow, I never thought about it that way. I, I, I'm happy. Right. Right. Shifting perception is the magic of the universe. Yeah, definitely. Right. Um, one other point we haven't touched on about Neptune is um, sensitivity. And, and it's oh, almost gosh. like a biological thing to some extent, or a physiological thing where sometimes People that have Neptune um, conjoining certain points in their chart will become incredibly sensitive in that area of their life, or um, even if it's like a connecting to some part of the chart that's connected with body parts or, or different physiological things, can be sensitive to like noise or to smells or to um, yes. you know different senses become heightened and become extra. Um, easy to be overwhelmed or to influence in and some way. They're extra sensory in that sense. Mm -hmm. It's not just ESP, but the extra sensory in terms of taste, touch, feel, smell, those kinds of things, and the hypersensitivity, because you've got this dissolution of people who are highly Neptunian, Piscean, whatever, the veil between realities conscious and unconscious becomes very thin. Mm. Part of their lessons is through what we call polarity points, so that's a, more of a Virgo Mercury thing, is about perceptional discernment, mm. right? Is about discerning and learning to practice what's real and what's not, mm -hmm. to filter and filtrate and make adjustments, not to erase it, not to let the linear mind convince itself that that isn't real. So there's a lot of bleed through that's coming on. And then again, the over, the tendency to over empathize, to over enmesh, part of that um, coping mechanism of Neptunian concepts is to cope by sending out unconsciously or consciously these psychic tendrils, these emotional psychic tendrils to sense the environment as a way of gaining enough information to be safe, mm. right? Particularly if you're in an environment as a child with a dysfunctional parent who might be alcoholic or have other dynamics issues that they're not dealing with, part of the way to survive is to try to read the psychic environment to know where they need to be, where is my parent in this emotionally, cycle, so that I can find my safe space. Mm. So there's a place for that in Pisces that's functional, and there's a lot of places for that to be dysfunctional. Because what can happen is the more the Neptune Pisces function sends out its tendrils into the world, consciously or unconsciously, the more information they're picking up, the more overwhelmed they are. Mm. And their systems are hypersensitive. And so the, the system gets overloaded. Right. It's like taking an um, extra dose of wateriness and, and just putting it in whatever life or whatever area it is so that if we think of wateriness as um, sensitivity and receptivity and use the word hypersensitivity, that's a really good word. I think so. I think so. And again, as you saw on my chart, Neptune in the fourth opposed the moon. Mm. Right. So uh, the moon's in Taurus. Uh, how I see that is I have a heightened sensitivity to other people's emotional space mm. as I've aged. I was in denial of it as a child because it was too overwhelming, mm -hmm. right? So I just blocked all of that out and lived in a more narrow world. In my dream state, there was fantastical things happening. I, I even waking would go into astral projection spaces that I didn't even know what they were. And uh, Kundalini risings as a child when I was six, which I didn't know what those were at the time, mm. and that just knocked me to the ground. Kids thought I was weird. Mm. I didn't know what was happening. I couldn't breathe. There was electricity running through my body, you know. And so this hypersensitivity to things when I'm around people whose energy isn't quite clean, there's prickly feelings across my body. That moon, that Neptune, uh, oppose that moon in Taurus, the Mars in Taurus. They're not by degree, but they're by sign. So that kind of prickly 
physical discomfort with things that can happen when I'm around things. I've had mm. to learn again to learn how to filter, to manage, to bring in practices that help me filter that out to find the dimmer switch and turn the darn thing down so that I'm, I don't have to, just because it's out there doesn't mean I have to be feeling it all the time. It's not mm. appropriate. It's not, it's also not healthy for me. It's also invasive for other people. So there's a, I've come to a morality place of that. It's not my place to be in their space or their emotions. Mm. If they want to share them with me, then they will. If they don't, then it's fine. And it's funny, I was, you mentioned the electricity thing, and you also have like Neptune like right on your ascendant. Yes, I do. So your ascendant's at 17, and, and Uranus is at 15. So you yes. have Uranus, Uranus on one angle almost exactly, and then mm -hmm. Neptune on the other angle. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Nice. Um, yeah, so the uh, I had to learn because there was at one point a Uranus uh, was squaring my moon, and now it's conjunct my moon. But mm -hmm. when it squared my moon um, and conjoined with Venus, I literally got red circles on the palms of my hand. Too much energy was running through the system. Mm. And I was actually doing massage work. I was a massage therapist and energy work. Mm -hmm. And I had to stop because okay. they were, it was painful. It was these hot, I mean, it was just, it was amazing. Mm -hmm. I mean, amazing in an awful way and amazing in a kind of, wow, that was kind of cool. Yeah. Or, uh, <laughs> or it was a funny, like a hashtag on Twitter. It was just astrologer good, which is when something bad happens, but like the transit fits so well that you're actually impressed more than you are <laughs> annoyed at, at it. Um, so I, like it. Uh, I know somebody who has Neptune prominent in their chart and they're very sensitive to sound and yep. they can get very easily like overwhelmed by yep. just like loud noises mm -hmm. and um, easily disturbed in their sleep mm -hmm. for, by noise and things like that. Me? And that. That's me. Yeah. Okay. I had freakishly good sound until the hearing started to go bad in my right ear. Mm. I mean, I could hear things. Some of it was even extra beyond you know, perceptional, right? Mm -hmm. um, eyesight strong, uh, touch extra sensitive to touch mm -hmm. and energies and that sort of thing. Um, uh, I have to have a black room with no light, not even the light of a clock, right. because it actually I can see it through my eyeball, my clothes. It's like when I have thinner eyelids. I don't know why. Right. Right. I can't. It has. It has to be dark. That mm -hmm. distracts me. It's too much. Um, loud. I can't turn up music loud in my car. It's too. It's too much. Loud sounds jolt me. Right. You know. Uh, so yes, that's a. It's definitely a Neptune, Neptune function. Thing. And I think it's really important. I think for astrologers to be aware of because um, from an external standpoint, if you're like with somebody and you don't realize that that's a thing and what that's like to actually live with. It can almost be weird or like annoying for somebody else who's just like, why are you freaking out about the sound or, you know, um, why are you so sensitive to things? But it's actually because they are much more sensitive than, let's say, the average person to basic um, sense perception in some way. I can smell things that other people cannot smell. Okay. Right. Yeah. Smell strong smells and and Absolutely. just to, to think about. Because I'm trying to think of an analogy where, like, an average person would even have that experience of having their senses like overwhelmed or flooded by something, and that's what you have to like imagine in order to be in that space of somebody that has a prominent Neptune. I know someone who actually had medically a situation. I don't know what it's called, where uh, sounds. I mean, it was she had to walk around with earplugs mm. in, and then eventually she just had to separate herself from the world. Her senses became just completely overrun mm. by the world around her, felt it physically, it just distorted her whole energy system. She couldn't even function or think straight. Mm. So that's a real thing. Right, yeah. Um, or also heightened sensitivity to like drugs or like ingesting yeah. things. It's me. Yeah. Um, yeah. All right. So there's one last author I wanted to look at before we sure. start to wind this down. Sure. Um, let's see. So one of them, oh yeah, it was uh, Reinhold Eberton and the Combination of Stellar Influences, which was published in 1940. And a lot of, it was translated into English from German and a lot of later astrologers drew on it, but it's mm -hmm. very concise. It just says, the principle of Neptune is receptivity, impressionability, a sympathetic understanding of people, um, the positive psychological correspondences are receptivity, fantasy or imagination, sensitivity, 
contemplation, sympathetic understanding or compassionate sensitivity, a dreamy nature, an inclination to mysticism or mediumship. Um, that was a good point, actually. When when Neptune was discovered not long after in like America, um, spiritualism became really big and like mediumship and and things like that in the 1800s. Um, the negative, of course, it did. Yeah, right. Right. One well, and we're interesting. We're going through Neptune and Pisces again right now. Um, and anyway, we can come back to that. It says the negative or challenging psychological correspondences: impressionability, sensitiveness, vagueness, or lack of clarity. Confusion, fanciful notions, deception, a lack of planning ability, and a lie or a fraud. Mm -hmm. um, sociological correspondence, people with a negative outlook on life who are easily influenced by other persons, mm -hmm. mediums, persons of doubtful character, crooks or tricksters. It actually gives a very largely negative slant with sociological correspondences for some reason, but otherwise even treatment of positive and negative in the previous section. Mm -hmm. Um, is there any other major components that we haven't touched on here today when it comes to Neptune? We talked about several combinations, like the really classic ones like Neptune Saturn, Neptune Mercury, Neptune Venus. Those are all pretty obvious and There's straightforward. There's Neptune Jupiter that's interesting. Okay. Because I think of Neptune sometimes as trying to take a sip from a fire hose. Mm. Okay. Right. You're trying to distinguish something small from something very grand, the infinite. Mm. Right. You're trying to, there's Neptune to me, as well as Jupiter, Jupiter represents possibilities, but in a way, they're the known possibilities mm -hmm. because it's inside of Saturn. Right. Neptune is beyond that. Right. So it's, <laughs> it's the infinite, infinite possibilities that we could know and, and not even know because. Neptune to me is the unknown unknown, mm -hmm. right? So um, with Neptune in difficult aspect or stressful aspect, or, it actually doesn't matter. Again, because I see the, the less stressful aspects of the trines and the sextiles to have their spectrum as well. Mm -hmm. So they can operate in shadow. Mm -hmm. So this is a place where, you know, a Jupiter and Pisces, Jupiter and Neptune, Jupiter in the 12th for me can in fact find it difficult to parse or to discern again if we think about that polarity point of mercury's virgo virgo and mercury over there mm -hmm. to discern what is real and what's not right and so what can happen with neptune jupiter is that because there are so po so many possibilities of what's true then what happens is they become in a space of where they are gullible, mm -hmm. where they are easily impressed upon by if somebody has a sense of clarity of the truth, even if it's not the truth, okay. then I'll go with that. So right? in terms of belief and like yeah. easily being led into certain yes. beliefs, if they yes. find somebody that seems like a compelling teacher? Yes. Okay. Right. And again, that projection of the guru, the projection of, projection of the great master, um, teacher who has access to the mystical realms. Again, that is the desire, that's Neptune's desire to merge, right? Mm -hmm. And to then by merging with someone else through osmosis, I gain what they have. Okay. Right? So there's a transference process in that. There's some Plutonian elements that come into that because I'm an evolutionary astrologer. So- uh, this so there's some components of that the the big lies that can happen with Neptune Jupiter the the cultish um, natures or the even someone being the um, the person who speaks the big lie and mm -hmm. is charismatic and just has enough um, truth to uh, catch people in that that reality right and where there are disconnects in something like that you have to get people to buy into the big lie so that the disconnects don't mean anything yeah uh, that's a really good point because i that's one of jupiter's primary functions is truth and that's always been a, a tr consistent significations in the western tradition is jupiter representing truth and, mm -hmm. and when you put it together with neptune sometimes it can be bending the truth or mm -hmm. using the truth selectively 
um, where I've noticed, for example, in some quote unquote like conspiracy theories or certain types of conspiracy theory gurus, part of the grift is to tell the truth like a certain percentage of yep. the time. So yep. you have like 10% or like 25% is mm -hmm. something that's actually valid, that's an interesting observation or like insight or behind the scene view and in, look into the world. But then it's like the other 75% is stuff that you just made up. Just made up. Um, so I'm thinking of like people like Alex Jones or, or somebody mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. um, but that's a really interesting. And then in that, you sort of set yourself up as an authority figure or a guru type figure. Um, yeah, so that's a good Jupiter Neptune sort of. Um, that's the shadow. Thing. Sure. Absolutely. What's the positive side of that? Jupiter and Neptune is um, that the limits of one's ego truth are tra being transcended, that the dissolution, which is the, I see as a positive function hmm. of Neptune, is to dissolve the false edges of one's truth of what ego what the ego is holding on to as true mm -hmm. and Neptune does its job to dissolve those so that's transcending you know Neptune is a water function so it's cyclical so it ebb like the tide it ebbs and flows and so that cycle is going to come back around to dissolve more mm -hmm. and so this is the transcending pro the transcendent nature of of transcending one's belief systems over time it can be the connection between the mystical divine out there being coming through and being able to speak the truth, see the truth, mm -hmm. um, narrate it out in the world. This is why those who have ill intention in their consciousness can actually tap into that stuff mm -hmm. just enough to to and they there's the the ego and narcissism that comes in that then they begin to believe their own story. I am the guru. I can see the truth mm. when it may only be, you know, and that's the, the, uh, what we call the, the, the expansion of the ego till it gets like a balloon to its thin stages and pops mm. and it collapses and Neptune will over time, it's not a fast pop, but eventually at some point, slowly and gradually that balloon will pop mm. and so the dissolution of that ego structure and so on so there are there are obviously and always the the spectrum for everything and mm. so that person who just sees and knows but has doesn't have the ego attachment ha walks with it humbly and knows that they they are they are tapping into the conduit they are not the conduit mm. right they are tapping into the message they are not the messenger right and that that's a very different narrative than i'm the messenger you must listen to my truth right yeah um that's really interesting so this is also bringing us into like the the philosopher or um somebody that's able to merge the more like left brain and right brain areas of philosophy and religion and things like that and maybe be able to codify um, transcendent truths into something that's a little bit more more tangible or a little bit more usable in the real world yes and what's really interesting and I do love the fact that so first of all let me set a premise for you in evolutionary mm. astrology just like most and most astrologers um, see Mercury as left brain okay right but in yeah. evolutionary astrology we see Jupiter as right brain mm. All right, so okay. it's intuitive, it's inductive, it's it's abstract. You have to believe, mm, right? right? And so there's this intuitive nature, sure. right? Right brain, not right brain creative as, but you get that. What's interesting is that in traditional astrology, taking out the outer planets, Jupiter and Mercury rules the mutable cross, right? And in my world, Jupiter and Mercury have everything to do about perception, mm. right? And so it defines in many ways the structure of our reality as to what we believe and what we think, mm. right? So to me, again, the mutable cross, having almost none of it in my chart, it took me years and probably through progressions getting into mutables, that really gave me a, a much grander and deeper understanding of mutability. Mm. And so really seeing it as the magic in the universe that I believe in, that one, one shifts one's perception through the dissolution of Neptune, through the gaining of higher information of Jupiter, through the accessing of information of Mercury ruling both Jupiter and Virgo, and excuse me, Gemini and Virgo, the filtration of that information and the discernment of that information, we gain all that and we shift our perspective, mm -hmm. right? And then reality changes from that, right? So um, 
I just I find I just wanted to throw that in there. I find that fascinating that the mutable cross is to me in so many ways the more powerful of the mode crosses. Right. Yeah, one of the it's interesting that in the, traditionally the contrast between the two Mercury signs of Gemini and Virgo and the two Jupiter signs of Sagittarius and Pisces is um, small things in the Mercury ruled signs yeah. versus very big things in the Jupiter ruled signs. And even in the modern um, rulerships, of it's kind of interesting in that context of putting Neptune in Pisces that you still get the same thing Huge. of going from small, practical, or tangible things to not just big things, but things that are so big that they're just immeasurable and uh, transcendent. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, well, uh, okay. So we've covered Jupiter. That's pretty good for Jupiter Neptune. Um, I know there's other stuff, but we're getting towards the end of our time here. Mm -hmm. um, are there any final things? You've done like lectures and workshops on Neptune, right? Yeah, I have. I've taught whole classes on them. I've done workshops on it. I've done lectures on it. Um, I love planets. I love the outer planets. Mm -hmm. uh, at ESAR next year, I'll be doing Pluto transits and Uranus transits lectures. I did one at Norwalk on the Pluto transits. Um, I did. I've done Neptune transits. Okay. You know, so Neptune is a meditative world, mm. right? So there's meditation, a place where you're transported or you transcend. Um, the day to day, again, Mercury Virgo humdrum nature, the tasks that we get involved with, and then we tick off, and the work we have to do, and and all of that. And I do believe, I believe Virgo to be a brilliant and absolutely necessary sign. And again, from a archetypal point of view of looking at these mutable signs, they are transition points. Mm. They are the signs where we transition into back into cardinal. Right? right, so they are huge transition points because if we think of along the the axis of the prime horizontal and the prime vertical, they are just on the other sides of the AC, um, MC, DC, and IC, the first, fourth, tenth, and seventh, and whatever order I went with. But right. they're just before that, so they're a big transitional process where adjustments have to be made, mm -hmm. and so um, and and also it's moving away from the two fixed signs of. Right. of the fixity of being in the stable middle of a mm -hmm. season to suddenly getting ready to move into a new season and that in between stage, which is transitional. Transitional. Like you said. Yeah. Right. And so there's such p power in these mutable signs. And so one of the things I wanted to say about Virgo is that ultimately we think about it as work and tasks, but something Demetra George said many years ago is about the sixth house in Virgo, or she was just saying about the sixth house, is it's the work that fulfills dharma. Mm. Right. So that's something that even transports that beyond the what seems to be the day-to-day -day tasks of the things that we're doing and that we get ourselves distracted by. And so when I think of meditation, I think more in lines of Zen Buddhist and Buddhist meditation, where the, the Buddhists believe that we are actually walking around in an altered state and that meditation is a place where we wake up. Mm, okay. Right. And so that mindfulness meditation is about that place of letting go of the monkey mind of the thoughts, you know, the sort of the Mercury, Virgo, Gemini chatter that's going on and and to let it, see it float away in a bubble to let it go, to let it go, come back to the breath, let it go, let it go, come back to the breath. And then what you, happens is that you get into that space in between moments, right? In that meditation, the space in between breaths. Mm -hmm. And that's very Neptune, again, transcending those moments, the, the, not to demonize them, not to consider them less, but to actually wake up into the moment of now mm. so that it's not a place we often think of meditation as a place where we are transported somewhere else, mm -hmm. right? Transcendental meditation up there, out there somewhere where I like the mindfulness, Zen Buddhist, be present, be here now, the awakened mind, the mindful mind, the intentional mind, the intentional moment. And that is this beautiful merging and blending of Neptune, Mercury, of Virgo Pisces that finds its harmony, its union, right? And so that that meditational moment, the the meditation is Neptune. It is the 12th house. It's that place of 
of of breath, mm. of giving space, of the p- place of grace and opening. That's that place where the fog gradually drifts away and the clarity of the moment comes through, mm. right? And I I just love that about Neptune, right? I, I, it, so often humans want to, especially when they're getting into astrology to begin with, is to sort of obsess about oh my God, I have Neptune here. I'm going to, you know, are you a drug addict? Are you, you know, the kind of thing my mom did Mm. when she was a young astrologer, right? To think about the negatives. And we need to be aware and mindful of them. But, you know, all that beauty and the potential of the Neptune uh, and its association with the 12th house and the association with Pisces, it's just, it's just grand and beautiful. Yeah, there's something very beautiful about it and something that is beautiful in a way that you're not used to experiencing and is beautiful on a, a level that transcends the basic um, conceptualizations of beauty that we commonly think about with, with Venus, like art or, mm-hmm. or flowers or something like that. There's something um, otherworldly about it that when you feel it occasionally, it's something that feels can feel very good. Right, and the connection between Venus and Neptune, again, is very clear. It's the higher octave of Venus, Neptune is. So you could pass by a piece of art and go, yeah, that's that's nice. Right. Right, there's the appreciation, mm-hmm. that's Venus. We appreciate that art, and possibly wherever you have Venus, you have the appreciation of the actual artist method and you know, so on, and how well they detailed what it is they were doing or captured it. Mm-hmm. But when you involve Neptune with that, you are pulled in to that imaginal world. You, It expands and opens. It's like standing in front of the piece in the Chicago Museum, the pointillist, uh, where they're standing in the park um, in um, Victorian clothes. And if you just soften your eyes, you begin to see the pointillism and mm. you begin to, you know, kind of enter into that or standing in front of a Monet or Renoir or, and just sinking into and tasting the color of the blue or feeling the color of the wa- you know the water and the water lilies and the color wash over you that's a neptune thing that's right. not a venus thing yeah yeah definitely right. and having that that sense of of feeling and living and being there and being transported there um through your senses or through something that's that's intangible and hard to ad- articulate mm mm-hmm. mhm yeah. Right. So, the, and that's that's you know that's the difference between, as I said, the difference between Venus and and Neptune. Mm. They have creative components, right? They they have that connection. Mm-hmm. Venus has appreciation and aesthetics and sees the value of something and what they appreciate. And Neptune is transported. Mm. It transcends the details of the artwork and the methodology and. All of that, it just transcends that. Right. And yeah. you can do it that with poetry and music and sound. Yeah. Right. All of that can be from an appreciation point of view or from an immersion point of view, right? Where you merge into that experience. Right. And people, maybe that's the highest. I don't want to say highest, but let's say practically speaking, one of the most constructive uses of Neptune is just people that are able to do that and convey that to other people of mm-hmm. of bringing that sense of transcendence into reality in some way and to share it with somebody else for even just a, a moment mm-hmm. through something i think that's a gift yeah right i mean and, and and then out of that gift again inspiration occurs to mm-hmm. inspire other people to to um reach for something within themselves that can be expressed after be living in somebody else's imaginal world however briefly right right it 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 opens our world to possibilities right so that's that's a gift yeah that's great so to inspire that's mm-hmm. such a great keyword and cuz mm-hmm. you can inspire somebody through um through art you can inspire somebody through um you know a belief you can inspire somebody through even a relationship mm-hmm. um there's so many different ways that you can inspire somebody in different ways but that's the core one of the core underlying beautiful components of it is just to be inspired right so even with saturn neptune be an inspirational leader mm, right right instead of a dictator yeah seeing a lot of the saturn and capricorn 
like people in their late twenties just going through their Saturn returns where they had Saturn conjunct Neptune and Uranus in Capricorn from the late 1980s was pretty wild because a lot of them that had their Saturn returns, it was also activating Neptune at the same time, and they had very often idealistic motivations <laughs> in the things that they were trying to bring into concrete reality. Yeah. Like um, I know one person at a local astrology group, they wanted to work on um, like a sort of group housing project in order to help build um, housing for low income people, and it was part of this motivation of like compassion that sure. was dr driving it, but it was being brought into reality through through Saturn. Yeah, I have my I have Saturn. Obviously, as you folks may have seen, I have Saturn in early Capricorn, so I had my second mm -hmm. Saturn return. Okay. So my first Saturn return uh, back in eighty nine, mm -hmm. when you're talking about that group being born, was a Neptune, Uranus, okay. and Saturn. Yeah, <laughs> going over right my Nep my Saturn right. So w which famously was also the disillusion of the Soviet Union at yes. the time. Yeah. So for me, it had a lot to do with my narratives around some pretty classical stuff. My father. Mm. Right, what, 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 the unrealistic expectations that I placed on my father, mm -hmm. and not really seeing him for the individual he was, but the archetype of father, and that how he must uh, must live up to that. Mm. And my disillusionment in my life uh, that I had claimed on that. And I have a I have a Neptune Saturn sextile in my natal chart. Mm -hmm. um, but you can, you know, if you go along with more modern narratives, the moon can be either parent mm -hmm. sitting up there, particularly in the tenth house, and so it's a parental dynamic. Anyway, it really was a beautiful thing where I was able to really release the disillusionment uh, that I had and mm -hmm. the illusions I'd placed on him, the unrealistic expectations that I'd placed on him, and the disappointment I had had with him, mm. right? And so when I – that was the seeds that were there for me to be present with him through his illness and death was for me to be really present with him, mm -hmm. not in that place of a little girl who had expectations of her father, but as a woman seeing a grown man with his foibles and downfalls and greatness and whatever that might be, right? right? And so, you know, Saturn, Neptune, Neptune to Saturn in a natal chart, Neptune transit to Saturn, You've got all kinds of things, right? You know, dissolving our uh, narratives and our beliefs about what personal authority means. Mm -hmm. Who has the authority to author my reality? What's real? What's not? Mm -hmm. Right? What are my? What are boundaries about? What are the? How are those? What's the structure? What are the limitations of what I thought was real? All of those things are, you know, in a natal chart with Neptune, Saturn. Those are going to be perpetually, consistently, cyclically challenged. And then under transits, you get targeted moments and targeted cycles through those aspects of intensified moments of those experiences. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, that reminds me, talking about that reminds me of something I noticed a few years ago during the Saturn Neptune. Square of squares of like 2016 ish, um, there were some pivotal things that happened in debates about um, house division. And I realized that like Saturn Neptune combinations were somehow tied in with the history of house division in Western astrology, which is such a funny literal manifestation because it's, you know, with different house systems, astrologers are trying to define the boundaries between the 12 houses. But you're an illusion anyway. Yeah, but <laughs> there's a, I mean, there's a like... lot of like nebulousness and ambiguity about where sure. the cusps are supposed to be and how astrologers calculate that in different good arguments where it may not be like one or the other, but it could be like both or, or all at the same time or something like that. Well, I still buy into. I mean, I do believe that. We, look, we've taken the ecliptic and we've mapped it to a piece of paper, and we've mm -hmm. wrapped the planets around that ecliptic, and then decided to divide the sky. Right. Yeah. All right. So we've de decided to divide the sky, and there are different methods for dividing the sky. And when we divide the sky, we've then mapped that onto a piece of paper, mm -hmm. and there are no divisions of the sky. It's just like drawing a line on a map. Right. Is that is. We've declared it as such, but it's all one thing. Yeah. It's still a 360-degree circle. Mm -hmm. There's a continuum along it. So whatever house division you might use that suits you, then great. Sure. Right? It doesn't make another one wrong. Right. Right? If my – we – <laughs> Which is such a hard thing for Saturn to cope with, but yes. it's such a Neptunian reality to say that. And here's a Capricorn, Saturn and Capricorn, Mercury and Capricorn saying it. Right. <laughs> yeah. Right? So – it's like, okay, uh, my husband's uh, uh, a general contractor, 
right? And um, he has a particular hammer that he likes. It's got the right weight for him. Mm. It's got the right grip. It does exactly what he wants it to do. And then he's got a guy over here who's got a different hammer that was never going to work for him. And if he hands his hammer to that guy, it's going to be awkward and clumsy. It's not going to work. Mm. But you know what they're trying to do? They're trying to hammer a nail into wood. Mm. And both of them do it. Right. If it's If they're skillful and they know how to use the hammer, mm -hmm. then they'll be able to strike the hammer into the wood. Some will be more efficient, some might not. Same with a screwdriver. What is its intention? It's to screw a nail into something. Right. It doesn't matter whether you use a screw gun, whether that thing's electrical, whether it's battery, whether it's handheld, whether it's got flowers on it, it doesn't mm. matter. Right. It doesn't matter, it does the thing. The point is, does it do the thing? Yeah, does it get the job done? Yeah. Right. Right. So if you find with your clientele and the type of astrology that you do, that it gets the job done and you get results, hmm. awesome. Sure. Right? But for my type of astrology that I'm doing, your methodology may not work. Hmm. That doesn't mean that my methodology is right mm -hmm. and that yours is wrong. It just means for what I'm doing, this is the tool I'm using. Sure. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, well, that's a good Neptunian lesson, I think, to walk away with in terms of the disillusionment of boundaries and what happens when you try to, when Neptune is introduced to Saturnian type boundary things, is is the blurring of lines. Um, yeah. All right. Um, I think we're at our time now. So this has been amazing. This is a great discussion. Thank you so much. This is this is one of my favorite of, of the planetary series so far because we just set this up like really quickly last we night because you were in town and yeah. we had no outline and just sort of yep. riffed on Neptune and we Neptuned our way through it. We did. And we Neptuned the snot out of right. one. <laughs> <laughs> um, so thank you so much for doing this. Uh, let's talk a little bit just to reiterate. So you're doing two conferences next year, not just I one am. conference. I am. So the Northwest Astrology Conference, which a year ago in 2012, like the pandemic, 2020, 20? the pandemic hit, and you had two months before six weeks, six weeks to Pivot. switch to an online astrology conference, and you pulled it off, and it was like wildly successful in May of 2020. Well, partially, I mean, a little bit, but also <laughs> partially due to your helpers like Nicholas Polimanakis mm -hmm. and and other people. And we My recorded children. a whole mm -hmm. podcast about that right after it had happened. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure what episode that is, but um, people can look for it in the archives from May of 2020. So then you did another online conference in 2021, but next year you're going to bring the Northwest Astrology Conference back in person in Seattle. That is our goal, okay. right? And you know, a lot of things can happen between now and then. Mm -hmm. uh, we need to. Good news that I've picked up over the last three days is that we've clocked in a million um, vaccine. Um, uh, a million vaccine vaccines were given for three days straight. So that's three million vaccines over the last three days. Okay, a lot of them were new. Uh, uh, and the other side of that was the second shot hmm. for people that had had them a couple several weeks ago. Okay, so that's encouraging. I'd like to see that trajectory increase. Mm -hmm. um, so our goal. So the, the the dates of the conference are uh, is, is the end of May, and it's late May. And I wish I could tell you the dates. I think it's May twenty sixth. Okay, I, I think those are the dates. You can go to norwac.net, n o r w a c dot n a c n e t. Sorry, norwac.net. Mm -hmm. You're gonna find um, the schedule disconnected right at the moment because I haven't built it yet. Mm -hmm. um, speakers are due to get me their materials, and I will build that schedule. The speakers are listed on the website. Nice. Those who have given me their bios, it's up. Mm -hmm. uh, but I do have all the photos. Um, the registration rates are up there, but the registration form is not built. That will open up in October as well. Okay. I had originally set it for October 5th, blindly not paying attention, as I can do, and I will need to shift that until after Mercury goes direct as well. So we're talking August, uh, excuse me, October for registration to open for Norwalk and October for ESAR to open. If I might talk uh, just a moment without too much time, yeah. we have established a new organization. There are four of us that kind of got together after an event, particularly in the EA community. And it wasn't just to the EA community where there were um, ethical violations of um, boundaries between student and teacher. Mm -hmm. And we had a town hall and we 
<laughs> I stumbled into the town hall and managed to be voted the president not too long after that okay. uh, to this organization that we were establishing. Wasn't my intention. Mm -hmm. I was just going to a town hall. So uh, it's called the International Association of Ethics and Astrology, mm -hmm. IAEA. We have an, a website, um, IAEA. Ooh, ethicalastrologers.org, okay. right? So we've got some great people on the board. Um, a Sparkly Cat just joined us. We have Omari Martin. Uh, we've got uh, Patricia Walsh, Margaret Gray, and um, Ann Orley, um, St uh, Wendy Stacy, uh, Michelle Gould. There's a lot of really great people who are doing a lot of really great work. Mm -hmm. uh, we have an ethics document. We're building an ethics document for conference speakers and an ethics document for conference attendees that we will publish at NORWAC. And, um, Norwich speakers will get it um, so that we're cl very clear about our boundaries mm -hmm. and what constitutes an ethical violation. Um, our main goal is to, at this point, is to educate. So we're putting, we've got some great people working on educational videos and we'll have, our website will be built around short, brief PSAs, which will go out into social media, mm -hmm. which, and then like Stormy Grace, and we've got lots of people doing short, brief PSAs about different topics and ethics because we want to teach young astrologers and regular astrologers and and pro so the providers and the consumers of astrology we want to teach them uh, hopefully and educate them on what is ethical and what is not hmm. so um our, our our point is education at this point right to be able to just get out there in the world and tell people you know this is what should be expected of your astrologer yeah right and just raising the bar in terms of ethics in mm -hmm. the astrological community mm -hmm. both in terms of teaching and consultations and, and conferences absolutely. and everything absolutely all of it straight mm -hmm. across the board so we're going to be talking about transference and all kinds of the Im imbalance of power dynamics and you know consultation fees and attribution and diversity and diversity language i mean we've got deep rich i mean the documents are up on the website you can find the ethics documents a lot of that stuff, um, we're going to have hyperlinks through the ethics documents to videos and further articles, articles we think are appropriate from the internet. The board is going to go through a diversity training. We have an outside company coming in that's going to take us all through a diversity training. So, you know, it's all happening. And so it, it's just phenomenal. And I'm, I'm blessed to be a part of it. I won't, my goal is to get them established mm -hmm. and to and to bring other people up into these positions but my job is to get the foundation that's what i'm good at get the structure in place let's do that it's something it can stand on it's 501c3 it's non you know all of that the mm -hmm. corporation all of those foundational elements uh raise funds do that kind of thing that's what i want to do that's and lastly amazing. um to promote self-promote uh my school um soul wise school of evolutionary astrology mm. uh co-teachers um patricia walsh and rose marcus we were all directly trained by jeffrey at different times me in 83 in the 80s rose in the 90s uh, early 90s and patricia in the later 90s mm. so we co-teach together and have um I teach the beginning level of chart synthesis, archetypes and chart synthesis, and they go into the level two where we do the foundational uh, EA work, and that takes two years. The level one takes uh, about a year. And so we have that. And then I have my own website, uh, lauranalbandian.com. Um, Brilliant. You wear many hats. Uh, I do. It's, it's amazing. It's crazy. It is a little crazy, but it's, it's inspiring. And it's also, it's interesting. Have you ever seen an influx? I've been shocked at the influx of younger astrologers into the community over the past two love to three it. years. Love it. Love it. Love it. Love it. Um, you know, this was, um, this has been going on for a while. Dimitri George started, you know, looking at that, nor, you know, mentoring, bringing younger people forward. Mm -hmm. um, Norwex started bringing Kepler students in to speak. Right. Um, so bringing younger astrologers in, and this was back, when did you speak for the first time? Uh, it's like 2006. Yeah. Because at my first conference I attended as a, I volunteered in the bookstore in uh -huh. 2005 when I was living in, in Seattle mm -hmm. for Kepler. Right. And so we were, hadn't really had anything formal prior to that, but we were working toward that. And mm -hmm. then came to that. And then over time it was Sam, bringing Sam as my 
my cohort, confidant, and partner in crime of in the g- greatest crime of the century is elevating um, the diversity of um, the of, of astrology, right. right? And I, I mean, in the most positive sense, you know, just it, just uh, building a ground floor. We, our intention never, and Sam and I were on the same page on this. Mm-hmm. Sam and I never had just the intention to to give away scholarships mm-hmm. to Norwalk so that we could have a diversity of people. That, that that's cool. That's great. Mm-hmm. We wanted a diversity in the speaking field, right? Which wasn't there, right? Right. So we had to cultivate, and so with Sam's brilliance and uh, pulse on the things that are out there and the people and what's going on and who he thinks can really get there, we've been able to cultivate our diversity people up into speaking and their careers have blown up. Yeah, uh, it's been amazing. That's one of the amazing things about the influx of younger astrologers over the past few years is the uh, explosion of greater diversity in the field than there was prior to that point Absolutely. from like why ever, whatever, for whatever reason six that was. Six years ago. You look six right. years ago and it wasn't. Yeah. And it's something actually people, younger astrologers actually need to understand that's tricky in terms of that it just wasn't that way prior to like five or six years ago. And there, there weren't as many people to draw on. There wasn't. That actually raises one question is how can people, um, you know, start speaking at conferences eventually. I mean, I usually tell people maybe to start trying to speak for a local astrology Absolutely. group, get experience and build from there because then you'll be able to get like a, a demo tape from giving a talk for a local group. Right. So um, I'm going to be doing Opa's Eye Astrologer. And one of the things that I'm doing at Eye Astrologer, and which I hope eventually to do, but my schedule's too busy, is to do um, an extended lecture on public speaking, mm. right? And some of that's going to include some some ethics elements of what to include, what to include and not to include in your presentation, mm. uh, triggering images, language, blah, 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 all that stuff. But sure. then about how to select topic, how to present, mm. and the distinction between um, what do you want to do? Do you want to inspire, or do, what do you want them to walk away from? A sense of inspiration of a larger overarching topic. Mm-hmm. Do you want them to come away with kind of an awe kind of thing that you showed them this technique, but they can't really use it, or do you want them to? And that's okay. Or do you want to do something that is more technique driven and more practical? Mm. I find that attendees want the practical mm. over and over and over again in the surveys comes back. That lecture wasn't, pra- I don't know what to do with it. It inspired sure. me, but I, I, I don't know what, I don't know how to use this. Yeah. You have to be a certain type of astrologer to pull off the, in, you have to be like Rob Hand to pull off the like just in, purely or, inspiring or lecture. Or Rick Tarnas. Sure. Yeah. Right. Mm. Um, I think uh, Lynn Bell. Mm, right. Right. These are people that can and have the capacity to inspire and you don't care whether you walked away with something. Right, yeah. In the sense of, I've got a technique now I can use. Yeah. Right. That's making me, I'm trying to remember where Rob's Neptune is because he's got almost like a Jupiter Neptune vibe in the way that he used to at Norwalk for years do what we would lovingly refer to as like the Sunday Sunday sermon. sermon. Yeah, and he would give this very inspiring lecture at the end of the conference that would like, leave everyone sort of inspired and, and go home with a, a real feeling of of something. It's true because he had this way of lecturing at that Sunday sermon where you weren't quite sure where he was going. Right. Right. He, was very, he had a lot of sad placements, very yeah. circuitous. Yeah. He's the only astrologer yeah. that can get away with these like wild yeah. digressions because yeah. they're actually interesting. Yes, they are interesting. Right. And if you've listened to him enough, you know he's going somewhere. Yeah, you know it's going to go you somewhere just, good. You, you just don't know quite yet where that's going. And right. then he brings it home, man. Yeah. And then you're like, your mind goes, Poof. Yeah. <laughs> but coming back to how does somebody lecture at Norwalk? Well, look, it's very cool to say at times, mm-hmm. you know, um, so and so out in the public sphere uh, had these people have um, Neptune sextile Mercury. Let me show you how that works. Mm-hmm. I also want to know how many people have that aspect where it doesn't work. Mm. I, I actually want to know that because these five people, three people that you said this works on, mm-hmm. yeah, it's a small sample. Sure, it's anecdotal in that sense, right? Yeah. So it's cool. It might be interesting. Um, and people might walk away and say, mm, that didn't work in my chart, or that wasn't applicable, or I don't see it working down the line. Hmm. I'd like to see something where you're showing me a little bit more, 
You know, there's obviously it's a 75 minute lecture. You can't do 60 people's charts. Sure. But you should have looked at 60 people's charts or looked enough. And actually, when I'm researching something, mm -hmm. I want to find the charts where it doesn't work. Sure. And I want to understand why. Yeah. Right. Yeah, or like the other extreme, probably not a great version of that is like just using your own chart, yes. for example, in like a lecture. Yes. Which is like sometimes okay. And obviously, our own charts are gonna, always going to be our best study sure. example sure. where we learn the most from because we have the most insight into our own lives. But right. it also doesn't necessarily make for good lecture if you're only talking about yourself. Correct. And people do like to have it personal, just don't make it all about you. Sure. Right. And so, you know, I'm going to be talking about in that, uh, and uh, hopefully I'll do it in another way or another format, but you know, how to keep eye contact, how to keep it interesting, mm. right? Inflection, body language, and a really importantly topic, right? How do right. you how do you get from point A to point B and mm -hmm. practicing and rehearsing and timing and making sure that in your overzealousness to present this topic that you don't have five hours of material right. that you're trying to present in 75 minutes and then you've spent <clears throat> three quarters of the 75 minutes uh, just language, you know, kind of you're meandering, right? Right, yeah. and then all of a sudden you look at the clock, and, you, and you've got yeah. so little time, and now you're at a full-on sprint, right, to try to deliver. So yeah. time management becomes interesting, and again, comments from surveys will tell me somebody's not managing their time well. Mm. They got distracted by a question in the audience that took them off topic. Somebody hijacked their lecture. Right. Um, uh, you know, all kinds of things. So I've, over 37 years, right, I've got a body of evidence yeah. of what attendees are saying mm -hmm. from our conference and what yeah. they say about speakers, right? They just read their PowerPoint. That's all they did. Right. Right. I could have just bought you know, I just could have gotten their PowerPoint and read it. You're listing off all of my like classic rookie mistakes that I have made at different points and uh -huh. like learn from, but also that are very common things that of people do and like learn from and eventually grow out of. Yeah. Um, that sounds like an amazing. So that's going to be an OPA talk or workshop. It's eye astrology. Okay. So for uh, it's not their OPA retreat, which I just did, but eye astrology is um, we select, we had. Um, so the students get up and do presentations. They learn how to write. They also learn how to write uh, a column uh, or a podcast or a thing or how to write a bio. Mm. Uh, they learn uh, about software. So then they public speaking and then they will get up and public speak. They'll have a short presentation. I'll be on a panel choosing. They get scholarships. They get or awards. They get uh, awards for being selected. Mm. You might get a monetary award that can help you jumpstart your business. Um, uh, and then I will select a new speaker for Norwalk. Part of their award might be and would be uh, speaking at a future Norwalk. Wow, nice. Right, so it's very it's very cool. We did yeah. it a few years ago in person. Mm -hmm. A lot, some of this is gonna be online and virtual and then they'll have some, some in, uh, hopefully some in-person stuff later in the year as well. Okay. So there, we're gonna be having an ethics discussion Sam's going to be on that. I think we're going to do independent ethics discussions mm -hmm. versus it being a full-on panel, I think. I'm not quite clear on it. So again, I'm going to choose the topic of uh, how you ethically speak, mm -hmm. uh, pr present, uh, and all of that. So okay. the ethics of that. And so this is the Organization for Professional Astrology. And I think Astrology, it's- Astrology, yeah. Yeah, and I think that's like opaastrology.org or something like that. Yeah, I, it is. It is opaastrology.org. Okay. Do you know the dates of that event? No, I do not. They're forming it right now, but you should okay. be able to go online, find an email, and yeah. connect with somebody. Kay Taylor is the president, and Maurice is, uh, I think, the president pro tem. He was before, and so he's assisting with things that are going on. And so, okay, yeah, I actually met and then had Kay Taylor on this podcast after seeing her talk on the outer planets at an OPA retreat, and mm -hmm. being so impressed that we did yeah. a earlier episode on the outer planets and relationships. It was a right. lot of fun. So she's, she's good. Great. Um, yeah. That sounds amazing. And I'd love to talk to you about that sometime after that event. That might be sure. a good follow-up po uh, podcast if you come through Denver again at some point, because I know there's a lot of young astrologers that want to know that information about how to you know, give a good lecture. Yeah. And it'll be, um, again, how to start your business, how right. to be professional, mm -hmm. you know, in the old days, it would be business cards, and you know, it's that right. kind of thing. Logo yeah. design, and you know, how do you build your brand? There'll be brand building, and mm -hmm. build your presence on 
social media and that sort of thing. It's all for the up and coming professional or the professional who's felt they've been languishing and not really kind of clear in where their business is going. Mm -hmm. iAstrologer is for you in that. Brilliant. Okay. Yeah. So people can check that out on the OPA website. And then finally, ESAR, um, all things going well and, and yes. fingers crossed we'll be here in Colorado one year from now yes. in August of 2022. Yes. Cool. Yes. The, there has to be the world turning really bad for that to not happen. Yeah. That is the trajectory. We right. are committed without question mm -hmm. to that outcome of August 2022 for ESAR. It's going to be a blast. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's going to be brilliant. It's going to be the biggest conference of the year. I'm, yep, I'm sure it's, it's more international. So there's yep. going to be people flying and in it's, from. It's a beautiful moon Venus conjunction in Leo. Okay. For the opening? Yeah. Nice. Okay. I like that. Well, I'll be looking forward to it and looking forward to seeing everybody there here in my home state in one year then. Yeah. Cool. Well, thanks a lot for joining me for this thanks, today. Chris. Yeah. It was great. Uh, you've got to get to the airport, I so do. we should wrap it up. Bye so bye. <laughs> thanks everyone for watching this episode of the podcast or listening, and we'll see you again next time. Special thanks to all the patrons that supported the production of this episode of the podcast through our page on patreon.com. In particular, thanks to all the patrons on our producers tier, including Nate Craddock, Thomas Miller, Catherine Conroy, Christy Moe, Ariana Amour, Mandy Ray, Angelique Nambo, Sumo Kopic, Issa Sabah, Jake Otero, Morgan McKinsey, Kristen Otero, and Sanjay Srihari. For more information about how to become a patron and get access to bonus content such as early access to new episodes or private subscriber-only podcast episodes, go to patreon.com slash astrologypodcast. Special thanks also to our sponsors, including The Mountain Astrologer magazine, available at mountainastrologer.com, the Honeycomb Collective Personal Astrological Almanacs, available at honeycomb.co, Astrogold Astrology Software for the Mac operating system, which is available at astrogold.io, and you can use the promo code ASTROPODCAST15 for a 15% discount, the Portland School of Astrology, available at portlandastrology.org, Astrogold Astrology App for iPhone and Android, which is also available at astrogold.io, and finally, the Solar Fire Astrology Software Program for Windows, which you can get from alabe.com, and you can use the promo code AP15 for a 15% discount.